back on the record, Mr. Murdoch is present with both lawyers and his investigator. Both lawyers for the state are present. The jurors are being lined up. Rise, please. Please be seated. <clears throat> Welcome back, and again, my humblest thanks for your service in this case. You may have noticed that one of your fellow jurors is not with us today and has been excused. This fact should not concern you in any way. Johnson? Yes, sir. It's been called Dwight Rogers. Mr. Alley over here will be assisting today with court security. Morning. 
Mr. Johnson. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. Would you please tell the jury your name? My name is Dwight Rogers. And Mr. Rogers, um, were you previously employed by the Haines City Police Department? Yes, sir. Um, how long were you employed by Haines City? Five years. Um, and you were no longer employed at Haines City? I retired, yes, sir. Okay. You retired? Yes. Um, and is that because you aged out or were you retired for another reason? Another reason. Okay. Um, did that have to do with uh, your physical injury? Yes, sir. Okay. Um, back on uh, January 5th of 2019, in the early morning hours, uh, were you on duty and working for Haines City Police? Yes, sir. Um, tell us what your duties were at that time. My duties at that time was to respond to calls within the jurisdiction or help any other agencies that need help assistance. And do you recall where you responded that night as it relates to this case? Yes, sir. Where was that? I referred to my report to the actual address, but it was a address in Davenport, close to our jurisdiction. Okay. Um, if uh, and, and you do have a copy of your report? Yes, sir. All right. If I was to say 737 Melbourne Drive in Haines City in the Sweetwater subdivision, would that refresh your recollection? Yes, sir. All right. And where, tell, tell us what you did when you got there. What did you see and what did you do? When I arrived on the scene, I seen a gentleman on the ground. At the same time, I hear a female screaming for help in the front patio. Um, I approached the gentleman. I noticed a gun to, on his side. So I pretty much advised him do not reach for the gun. If not, I will use deadly force. Um, once a deputy arrived on the scene, detained him. I went to the residence, entered. And I noticed a once I entered inside the residence. Went okay. to the, Let me back up for a second. Okay. Where the you heard the lady calling, or where was that location? She was on the porch. All right. Did you attempt to gain entrance to the porch? Yes. And were you able to do that? No. Why not? The doors locked for okay. some reason. So the, that porch door or that floor room door was locked? Yes. What did you do? Went to the other door. I was advised by a neighbor that there was an additional door where I can gain entry into the residence. All right. And I'm going to show you um, what's previously been entered into evidence as Exhibit 1. Uh, see if you recognize this as the residence that you approached. Yes. All right. And the door that you're talking about, uh, can you see that open door in the stairway right there that you attempted to go into? Yes, sir. All right. And could you show us where it is? And then I'm going to put it up on the thing. Right? This door right here. Okay. I do that because sometimes it's hard to see way over there. So I'm putting exhibit one up on the, on the overhead. Um, so this is the residence that you um, yes. arrived at. Yes, sir. And I think well, while I was up close to you, the... Um, the door that you said was locked was this front one right here that is currently open. Yes, sir. All right. Um, now, you indicated there was another entrance that you were able to get into. Yes, sir. Uh, and where, if we were to look at the picture, if you, I know you probably can't see it, but where would that have been located? It would be in front of the white vehicle. So, somewhere over here in front of the white vehicle? Yes, sir. All right. And was that door locked or unlocked? Unlocked. So, what did you do? Enter the residence. Uh, once I entered, I noticed there was a smear, blood smear on the floor. I went towards the back of the residence to clear out the residence for safety reasons. Once I entered the master bedroom, I looked to my left and I noticed there was a foot hanging outside of my closet. I went to that foot and I noticed uh, there was a female laying um, on the shoe boxes. There was urine, on, what I perceive to be urine on the floor. And she was lifeless. I tried to do a sternum rub. I checked her pulse. There was no pulse, and she did not respond to the sternum rub. Um, what did you do after that? Once, I, after that, I went towards the front of the residence to try to assist with the female who was screaming. Once I arrived on scene, but she was already being treated by paramedics. Okay. So, did you go out back uh, the same way you came in, or did you go through the the front to try to open the door from the other side. The front, to open the door. All right. Um, you have any other involvement in the case? 
once the um, deputy arrived and um, the tech just arrived, I have no other involvement with this case. Thank you very much. Ross? Good morning, sir. Good morning. So when you arrived, was a Lieutenant Baldwin or anyone with Polk County Sheriff's Office on scene yet? When I first arrived, no. And when you arrived, you saw a male sitting on the ground by the lamppost in the front of the residence? Yes. And if I could just... So the lamp post we see, which is off to the right in this photograph, the the white male that you described or you indicated was sitting by the lamp post in that in that picture. In that area. Yes, in that in that area. Yes, sir. What do you know what this marker is over here? I do not know. You do not know. And this person was sitting on the ground? <clears throat> yes. And at that point, you directed the person to lie, lie on the ground, yes, right? Uh, place their hands up and then lie on the ground? Yes, ma'am. Did they ever get up? No. So, I think you were also with another officer of your agency as well. Do you no, it's a PCS deputy. Okay, so he was by the second, I think. Sorry, I'm sorry. He was second. I was first on scene, he was the second on scene. Okay. And would that would have been um Deputy Rojas? I'll have to report to our report to look at his name. Absolutely. Yes ma'am. All right, so you arrive first Rojas arrives after you. Yes, ma'am. And Deputy Rojas is said to um, stay with the individual that was found sitting by the lamppost. Yes, ma'am. While you entered the residence. Yes, ma'am. And you entered the residence because someone had told you there's another way of getting inside the residence. Yes, part of the neighbor, yes. A neighbor. And that would have been Ronald Blackmore. Not sure his name after the first report for his name. Sure, go ahead. Yes, ma'am. Now, you, you testified on direct that you saw the male that was sitting by the lamppost and that you also saw a female victim or, or, or victim that was by the, the um, floor room or the, the porch. Yes, ma'am. Isn't it true that you first saw the white male that was sitting by the lamppost, that you went through the house, and that when you exited the house, that's the point in time that you saw the female that was lying in between the door and the line. Does that no. make sense? No, can you rephrase that, please? Sure, that was, that was an awful question. What point in time did you first see the female that had been shot? Which one? The one on the porch. I noticed her when I first arrived on the scene because she was screaming for help. Okay. When you're trained as an officer by the police department, you're trained to document a report, correct? Yes, ma'am. And the purpose of documenting all of the things that you do and hear and see is so that years later, your memory can be refreshed if you forget, right? Yes, ma'am. Which you've done multiple times this morning, right? Yes, ma'am. Where, <clears throat> where in your report did you indicate that you heard this female screaming for help or yelling for help? I refer to that to my report. Yes.
I did not. You did not? No. And that would have been something important that you would have put in your report, right? Looking back at it, yes, ma'am. Okay. Thank you, sir. Redirect? Just a couple of questions. Um, I'll go backwards. I'll start with the last thing that Ms. Toomey asked you and move ahead. Um, that particular question about whether or not you heard the female or whether you documented it in your report, uh, as you sit here today, you do specifically remember that person screaming. Yes, sir. And if there was other evidence that that person was screaming, that would corroborate what you independently remember. Yes, sir. Now, as a patrol officer, do you work homicides all the time back in the day with Haines City? Yes. Okay. Um, this particular incident, did this one stand out for any particular reason in your mind? Yes. Why is that? It was my first homicide as a rookie officer. Okay. So, the, the, the senses, the sounds, the smells, the sights, this is something that you recall this incident specifically? Yes, yes sir. Right. I'm going to go and back up just a little bit when uh, the defense asked you about uh, the white male in the front yard. Um, that individual, when you approached him, um, you indicated that you demanded that he go from the sitting position and lay down, correct? Yes, sir. Right. Did he comply with you? Yes, sir. So he apparently understood what you were saying? Yes, sir. I have nothing further. Thank you. Is this witness released? Yes. Ms. Toomey? Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Next witness. Tracy Wright. Good morning. You may proceed. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. Would you please tell the jury your name? Um, Tracy Wright. And would you please spell both your first and last name? T R A C Y W R I G H T. Um, would you please tell us what you do for a living? I'm a crime scene investigator. And I'm going to ask you to speak up just a little bit because we got folks way down the end over here. Uh, and who are you employed by? The Polk County Sheriff's Office. And how long have you been employed by the Polk County Sheriff's Office? About 23 years. Um, do you know uh, an individual named Linda Hill? Yes. Uh, did you used to work with her? Yes. And did you work with her for many years? Yes. At the time she was with the Sheriff's Department, did she do the same type of work that you do? Yes. Now, with regard to this scene, um, I guess my first question is, uh, what role were you assigned as the crime scene investigator in this case? Um, I was the lead uh, crime scene investigator. And how was that determined who is the lead on a particular scene? It just depends um, if the other person has a lot of reports out and stuff like that, and I'm caught up, then I'll take the call, take the lead. Okay. And as the lead uh, crime scene investigator on a scene, what is your responsibility? Um, so we photograph the entire scene, we collect the evidence, we document the scene. Now, are there often times when other crime scene investigators will assist you? Yes. And in this case, did you have assistance? Yes. But your role was the lead crime scene investigator? Yes. Now, uh, we learned a little bit yesterday about what crime scene investigators do and that there is a protocol for that. Uh, could you tell us a little bit about what the protocol is when you get on to a scene like uh, what we're going to talk about in this case? So, um, we begin first by photographing the scene. We want to document everything we can as we see it when we get there. 
Um, and then we take measurements and then we start collecting evidence and packaging evidence. Why do you take all the photographs first before you touch anything? Because we want to show it as it is when we see it when we get there. Is there a particular method for packaging evidence once you recover it and, uh, you know, take custody of it? What do you mean? Is there a particular way, protocol, for packaging different types of evidence that you may uh, pick up at a crime scene? Yes. So give us an example of uh, uh, what are the types of uh, things that are taken into consideration when you package evidence that you recover. Um, so if we have, like, spent casings or that type of thing, we try to put it in a... It's changed now, but we put it, like, in a paper envelope. We try to put anything like that, that might have um, go to the lab or do DNA or anything to be in paper, whether it be a box or a bag. Okay. So in part of the packaging, there is a method to preserving the integrity of the piece of evidence so that it can be tested. Yes. Like you don't pick stuff up with your bare no. hands. Okay. I've seen that on Hawaii Five-O. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and in this case, did you follow all of the protocols um, that are outlined uh, by your agency and, and uh, you know, in, in your line of work? Yes. So what I want to do now is go through some of the photographs that you took. <coughs> and I'm going to start with, um, it's, it's, it's in sections to make it easier. And some of these have already been admitted into evidence, but since you were the uh, primary, I'm going to give them to you. This is, uh, for the record, this is uh, States Exhibits 1 through 21, and I want you to look through those. Uh, try to keep them in that strange order of some are sticking up and some are sticking down, because um, that delineates which has already been placed into evidence. So you've had a chance to look through those? Yes. Um, with regard to all of those exhibits, uh, do you recognize what they are? Yes. What are they? Photos from the scene. All right. um, and are they fair and accurate photos? Yes. At this time, I would ask that States Exhibits 1A, 8 through 11, and Exhibit 20 be admitted as full exhibits. Not 21, I believe. I'm sorry, any, and 21, yes. Any objection? If I could just read them. Would you show this to me? Sorry. Thank you. Sorry. I'll give you the next step first. Objection, Ms. Timmy? No, sir, you don't. It will be received. Um, what I'm going to do now is, is put them back into the order. Um, and obviously, for housekeeping purposes, I can't reintroduce something into evidence. So you'll have to apologize that we're going through this piecemeal. Um, we're going to do this a couple more times, and then we'll go through all the exhibits, OK? OK.
Now I'm going to show you what's previously been marked for purposes of identification and or introduced into uh, evidence. <coughs> States Exhibits 22 through 51. And the ones I'd like you to focus on are the ones that are standing up. Well, you can look at all of them. And again, I'm going to ask you the same question when you're done. <coughs> Had a chance to look through those exhibits? Yes. And uh, are they all fair and accurate depictions of uh, the crime scene that you took that evening? Yes. All right. This time I'd ask that states exhibits uh, 22, 23, 24, 25, 26, 27, 28, 29, and 30, as well as States Exhibit 32, 33, 35, 37, 39, 41, 43, 44, 49, 50, and 51 be admitted as for exhibits. 51, I believe, is in evidence, correct, Madam Clerk? Um, no, sir. I, I show 52, but not 51. Right. Any objection? No, sir, Your Honor. They will be received. I'm going to show you the piles thinner, by the way. Exhibits 52 through 58 for identification, and some have been admitted, but please look through those and let me know if you recognize what they are. chance to look through those? Yes. Are they, well, what are they? Um, photos of apparent blood in the bedroom. All right. Are they fair and accurate depictions of the photographs that you took on the, uh, during your investigation in this case? Yes. This time I'd ask that states exhibits 53, 54, <coughs> 56, and 58 be admitted as full exhibits. Any objection? No, sir, Your Honor. They will be received. Showing you exhibits 59 through 82. If you do the same thing, take a look at those and tell me if you recognize what they are.
had an opportunity to look through state's exhibits 59 through 82. Yes. What are they? Photos um, from the master bedroom and of the victim. Are they fair and accurate uh, images of what you observed and photographed that evening? Yes. This time I'd ask that state's exhibit 60, 61, <clears throat> 62, 64, 65, 67, 68, 71, 73, 74, 75, 76, 77, 78, 80, 81, and 82 be admitted as full exhibits. Any objection? No, sir, Your Honor. They will be received. All right, the last batch, uh, states exhibits 83 through 108, if you would please take a look through those. Let me know when you're done. Have you had an opportunity to look through state's exhibits 83 through 108? Yes. Right. And what are they? Um, photos of the front porch, the living room, dining room, master bedroom. Are they fair and accurate photographs of what you observed and photographed the night that you were investigating the scene? Yes. This time I'd ask that state's exhibit 94 <coughs> through 105 admitted as full exhibits. Does your packet include 88D, which was not previously entered? I just want to make sure I know what you're offering. It's just right. Well, let me just double check here. Sometimes I've tried to put them all in the right order and some of them might have gotten turned. physical evidence so that is I'm sorry so 88 D would not be included any objection no sir your honor they will be received all right now that we've got all the housekeeping out of the way let's get to the uh, but what you did with the photographs all right show you exhibit 109 that's already been introduced into evidence and ask if you have seen this diagram before yes and is that a fair uh, depiction uh, maybe not the scale of the residents at 373 Melbourne Drive in Haines City yes right. and are the photographs that you've taken that you've reviewed um, are they photographs that were taken within that location that we can identify approximately where the photographs were taken to help the jury understand yes. kind of the layout. Yes. What I've done, and this is for demonstrative purposes only, 
Exhibit 109 is also been blown up so that we can simultaneously use the overhead as well as this for purposes of demonstrative um, demonstration. <coughs> That's going to make my OCD not go too well later. Does that look all right? Yes, sir. That was going to make me crazy. It was crazy. <laughs> all right. Um, if, if it would be helpful, or would the court permit the witness to stand down? She sure. might. And for the record, I'm going to start with states exhibits 1 through 21. And right, what I'd like to do is kind of go through the crime scene, and why don't you get over this way? Well, actually, you can stay there. as long as you can see what we're doing. Let me give you a little pointer. Okay. Okay. Now, some of these the jury has seen before, but they might not know the relationship of where things are. Uh, and you indicated that you took a lot, a lot of these phonographs. Yes. And um, what we're going to do is we're going to talk a little bit about the scene and what you collected. So looking at Exhibit 1, uh, that, where was that taken from? And again, we can see the picture, but we're also making a record. So just right. looking at the picture doesn't describe where it was taken from. Right. So this would be the front, uh, well, um, off the roadway. So the road is right here, and this is the porch. Okay. Mm -hmm. And if we were now to look, uh, well, let's continue looking at Exhibit 1. There appears to be a couple of little yellow things in the front yard. What are those? Those are items of evidence. And tell us what the little cards are. Do you, is that something that you carry with you, or what is that? Um, you mean the um, marker number? Yes. Yes, we carry them. And, and what's the purpose of those? Obviously, there's kind of an obvious reason, but tell us what that is. To document the crime scene, and so you can easily tell. Um, you can see. If I didn't have the markers, you wouldn't be able to see where the items were. Okay. And also, does that keep people from stepping on them? Yes. Or kicking them and moving them some other way? Yes. Right. Is it also a way for you to document in your report uh, where a particular item was located by giving it a number? Yes. All right. So it helps you keep track of stuff? Yes. All right. So in the uh, Exhibit 1, uh, I see two marker cards, and, and I'm kind of glaring here. What are the marker numbers that are indicated in Exhibit 1? Um, number 1 and number 2. So, uh, marker number one for the record, where is that located in regard to the property? Again, for the record, we can see it's on the grass, but tell us. Um, south of the driveway, near the light post. And um, this is a kind of a away version. What is Exhibit 1A now, again, for the record? Um, that was a, I believe that was a cell phone. Okay. And that's a close-up? Yes. I notice that there's also a uh, what appears to be a, a blue glove. Uh, what would the purpose of the blue glove be? So a lot of times prior to us getting on scene, they will put a glove or a business card or something to mark where it was um, before we get there to preserve, preserve it so nobody steps on it or messes with it. And a, a blue glove, is that the type of thing that the law enforcement carries? I mean, you carry blue gloves? Yes. And are they typically pull them out of a box? Yes. Are they considered sterile for your use? Um, yes. I mean, you can touch yeah, them? Yeah. Okay. Um, so that perhaps, uh, the mark that goes down before the marker so no one kicks or steps yes. on the cell phone or whatever it is. Looking at Exhibit 2, what are we looking at there? That's just a, like a mid -range mid-range photo of marker two. Okay. And I'm going to go to exhibit three. Uh, what are we looking at there? Um, so there's a handgun that was marked again prior to my arrival so they could mark it so nobody would step on it or disturb it. Um, I think it was a bag of some sort. So, so they stuck a paper bag there just yeah. to show that there was something there. Yeah. Now, by the time you all got there, um, we see that that was not still on the ground, but yet there's a number two. Right. Um, is that something that you would have collected? Uh, no. Okay. But, I mean, as far as the gun. The gun, yes. Yeah, the that's paper right. Bag. No, no, not the paperback. Uh -huh. The gun is something you would collect. And it appears that you collected that 
fairly quickly. Yeah. Now, is there a reason you would pick up a gun and collect it fairly quickly as opposed to, say, a cell phone or something like that? Um, well, I prefer to collect everything on the outside first because you never know with the weather. Um, people coming through the scene, you don't want to take a chance of anything um, contaminating the evidence. And guns in particular, can those be of interest to other people that might see them on the ground <coughs> and desire them? Okay, so uh, the fact that it does not appear in Exhibit 2, the gun is not on the ground, that that is any cause for concern in, in this case? No. All right. Now, going to Exhibit 4, what are we looking at in that exhibit? So that's a close-up of the hand. Now, looking at this photograph, is that in the same condition that it was when you photographed it? I mean, when you came upon it? Yes. So you didn't touch it at this point? No. You didn't rack the slide back? No. You didn't touch it in any way but take a photograph of it? Correct. Looking at Exhibit 5 now, could you show us, first of all, approximately where that would have been on our diagram here? So that These um, are right here. Okay. So kind of in the corner of the front of the house by the by doorway. Yeah. Right. And uh, what, what are we looking at there as far as... Uh, items of, of potential evidence. So those are spent casings. Right. And of course, we, we, we'll get back to them in a minute in, in some detail, but does each card represent a separate spent casing? Yes. And uh, that's the purpose that those cards are put there? Yes. Looking at Exhibit 5A, what are we looking at there? That's the, the um, entrance to the porch. And that appears to have been taken prior to putting the three, four, and five cards down yeah. for the spent casing. Looking at 5B, where is that photograph taken? That's the inside of the porch. Right. And roughly, if we were to look at our diagram here, roughly, where would you be uh, standing? Well, I would be standing here. Okay. And looking in what direction? Looking in this way. Looking at Exhibit 5C, where was that taken? And That's also the front porch. That would be right in here. And you've got folks right behind you. I'm so sorry. That's okay. Let me know what I do. I'm going to make this so that you can whack me if I step out of line so you can okay. get a little further over there and tell us about it. So that would be right here. And what direction would that photograph be looking then? Towards the living room. Okay, so looking okay. back this way? Yes. Looking at 5D, what are we looking at there? Okay, so that was a chair that was um, right over here. All right. And is that, I'm looking at the handle here from the screen or the glass door, is that looking back out on the porch through the broken glass? Yes. All right. And looking at Exhibit 5D, is there anything of any significance to the way that that glass is broken in regard to this area of the door? Well, it appears that there was possibly, that was a bullet hole. Is that part of the reason that that picture was taken by you? Yes. Looking at Exhibit 6, tell us a little bit about what we're looking at there. So, this is another angle um, on the porch where I added some broken over. And where on the porch are we looking? So and it would be in this corner here. So that, that's, the chair. that's the chair, and that's the chair we're seeing in Exhibit 6. Yeah. Looking at Exhibit 7. Uh, 7, and it happens to be corresponding to the placard number. I did not do that on purpose. All right, what are we looking at there? So that's the other chair on the porch. That one's right here. Exhibit 8, what are we looking at there? So that's a marker number that I placed. It's kind of like right in this area. And sort of between the chair and the wall? Yes. Looking at a close-up of Exhibit, uh, or a marker 8 that is actually Exhibit 9, what are we looking at? What are you indicating by the marker there? I believe that was a projectile. A fragment of bullet projectile. Um, 
looking at Exhibit 10. Where are we looking at there? So that would have been somewhat behind the chair over in this area. And a close-up, which would be Exhibit 11 of <coughs> Marker 9. What are we looking at there? Um, jacketing. So a jacketing, um, what, in, in your kind of terms of art as a crime scene investigator, what, what would you call a jacketing? What would that be describing? So it basically covers the outside of the um, projectile, the bullet. And do sometimes the, the core of the bullet and the jacketing, in your experience, do those separate sometimes yeah. when they strike an object? Yeah. So you'd refer to one as the core and one as the jacketing? Yeah. And I, we have other folks that deal with firearms full time, but you know enough in your job over your 23 something years mm -hmm. to recognize that this is something that may be of some evidentiary value. Yeah. Looking at exhibit 12, what are we looking at here? Okay, so this is going in towards the living room, right here. So looking on the floor, but looking into the living room. <coughs> looking at exhibit 13, what are we looking at here? So that's an area of blood that would have been right in front of the glass doors and the cell phone, and a pair of glasses. And we're going to get to this later, but the things that you have noted in the, uh, the cards, the little yellow numerical cards, are those things that you go back later and actually collect? Yes. Okay, and, and we'll talk about that. For example, the cell phone, uh, <coughs> is that something that you actually collected? Yes. And the glasses, was that something you collected? Yes. And as far as the blood, uh, you, you don't really collect that, but do you do something with it to preserve um, something? Can, that, yeah, we obtain swabs, swabbings of that area. Okay, and, and the purpose of that swab is to do what? Um, well, if they send it to the lab, they can be, determine whose blood it is. Okay, um, sometimes they can determine DNA and things yeah. like that. Okay. Exhibit 14. It's just a close up of the glasses. Okay. And again, I know they sound sometimes like silly questions, but we are making the record so we could see its glasses. But if I just said, here's 14, we wouldn't know what the record says. So here's exhibit 15. What are we looking at there? There's a cell phone. All right. And that's the same one we saw in the bigger picture or the, the further yeah. away picture. Um, here's exhibit 16. What are we looking at there? That's just another photo showing the cell phone. Exhibit 17. So that's um, after I collected the cell phone, um, beneath it was a tube. All right. Looking at Exhibit 18. That's a close-up of the tube. And did you actually collect the tooth as well? Yes. Looking at Exhibit 19. That's just showing the overall of that area. Um, it, it, as far as the placards, does that now kind of spill into the actual floor of the living room. Yes. All right. And the first placard that separates, we have 10 here, which is whereabouts on the threshold. So placard 11, where does that now take us? That would be right in here. All right. So we can see the connection and the distance or the relevant position of the two. Yes. Let's move to exhibit 20. What are we looking at there? That's marker 11. And finally exhibit that's a close up of it. Now, what is it that we're actually, or you, we're actually marking here for purposes of uh, evidentiary value? The apparent blood. All right. Now, is that something that you were able to collect? Yes. All right. And again, how would you collect that? Um, we obtain swabbings. Right. And could you tell us a little bit about that procedure of a swabbing? What is it that you do to collect the blood or DNA from a surface like this? So we have, um, they're prepackaged swabs. Um, if it's dry blood, then we apply distilled water and we'll swab it and then put it in paper. If it's wet, we'll just swab it with the swab and put it in paper. And again, that procedure, that protocol for putting it in paper, what's the purpose of that? So it doesn't destroy any DNA. What if you stuck it in a Ziploc bag? That's bad. That's bad. Why is that bad? Because it could destroy it. Okay. And it's, since it's wet, is there a possibility that it could get moldy or yeah. things like that? Okay. 
So there's a there's a method to this protocol or a reason for that. Yeah. Right. You follow that in, in all of these procedures in this case? Yeah. All right, I'm now going to go through exhibits 22 through 51. And we're going to kind of pick up at marker 11, or where, what marker 11 was. And we're now going to go a little further. to make this continuous, uh, going back to Exhibit 12, um, we just talked about marker 11 and the fact that you were identifying a, some suspected blood. And you, you have to call it suspected blood when you do it, apparent blood. Um, now, you've seen a lot of blood on crime scenes in your day. What's the term of art for apparent blood? Why, why do you call it apparent blood as opposed to just calling it blood? Because we don't know for 100% that it's blood. Until it's tested. I can tell it looks like blood, um, but until it's tested, we can't say it's for sure. And that's why you take the swab. Yeah. Right. So going back to Exhibit 12, we just kind of focused on the details of Exhibit 11, or Marker 11, excuse me. Uh, and can we see uh, Marker 12 in this photograph? Yes. All right. So let's go to exhibit 22, which would be what? Um, Marker 12? Yes. And what are we looking at in that? Uh, looks like the parent projectiles. And this is the kind of the close-up, or one of the close-ups. I'll go to exhibit 23. Um, that's a little bit closer up. And if I was to go back to exhibit 12, could you show us on the map approximately where that 12 would have been? That would be right here. All right. So continuing to exhibit 24, uh, and I've noticed so far the cards seem to be numerically placed uh, as you go along. That's a, you do that intentionally, generally? Yes. Okay. So what are we looking at in exhibit 24? So this is an area rug that's in the living room. Where would that be if we were to? That would have been right here. Somewhere in that area. And of course we can see there's a couch in the picture and a couple of things. Um, and this is to get an overall, yes. to show where the relation of the placards are yes. to each other. Exhibit 25, what are we looking at there? So that's marker 13, which is a cigarette butt. Exhibit 26. That's marker 14 with a pair of glasses. Now we move to exhibit 27. What are we looking at there? Um, so I'm showing in relation to those markers, the other markers. 15, 16, 17, 18. Okay, so now we step back and look at a bunch and then we're going to go into detail as to each one. All right. So at marker number 15, uh, and again, this where would this be located in our, our picture here? This is right in here. All right, and, and what direction are we facing? Facing up, sort of, to, yeah. the, to this back wall here. Yeah. All right. Looking at Exhibit 15, um, we're looking at, I'm sorry, not Exhibit, Placard 15, which is Exhibit 28. Uh, and actually, I'm going to skip right to 29 because it's a little bit more close. What are we looking at there? It's like a parent jacketing. So that would be that outside of the bullet we talked about. But it appears to me to be kind of a coppery color. Yes. Is that one of the ways you distinguish between a, a core and a jacketing? Yes. Looking at exhibit 30, what are we looking at there? Um, so it's 
this marker 16, which I think is just a pair of blood. Okay. Now, again, we talked about you collecting different things. Is this an area that you would collect blood? Yeah. Right. And, and in this case, you did in fact collect blood from area 16 or marker 16. Yeah. Did you use that same swab protocol that you talked about? Yeah. Looking at exhibit 31, where are we looking in that instance? Okay, so these are markers 17, 18, and 19. Um, and I'm marking the areas of the parent blood. Right. And if we look at that, where would that be? Right in? So that would be right in here. Okay. So the table, even though it's a glass table in the picture, we have a brownish representation. So those would be sort of the, between the rug and the table. Yes. So if we look at exhibit 32, and then I'm actually going to jump to 33, what would placard 33 appear to be? Oh, that's a bullet fragment. Okay. Again, something that you would note for possible evidentiary value. Yes. Looking at exhibit 30, what is this one, exhibit 35, what are we looking at there? Yeah, you, can, you can peek in there, just don't stand there too long so people can see. Oh, I have to look at my map thing I have. Okay. Uh, if we go back to, you, you're talking about where it is or what it is? What it is. Okay. Um, you did write a report on this case. Yes. Okay. Um, so that is a... Something that you noted is okay, and we'll get to that in a little bit. Let's go to 34 now. What are we looking at here? Um, a pair of blood. And again, it's just now we're continuing kind of with a, a bigger view of several placards. Yes. 18, 19, 20, and 21. Yes. And at 19, uh, what is it for the record that we're looking at? Um, blood smears and drops. And where approximately in our diagram here would this have been taken? So that would have been right over here. Right. Now, as we've gone sequentially, just so that everybody's on the same page, you started down here at the door, or right outside the door, and ha have you now traversed all the way along until approximately this point? Yes. So this is what the numbers are showing, and this is the different items, whether it's blood, projectiles, a tooth. These are the things that you're documenting in your photograph. Yes. All right, looking at exhibit 36, what are we looking at here? Those are um, more marker numbers. Uh, and for the record, what marker numbers are we looking at? 19, 20, 21, 22, and 23. And as far as going back to marker 19 and exhibit 37, um, I think you told us this was documented to show what? The apparent blood on the floor. Also, exhibit 38. The apparent blood. Okay. Now, um, the, there appears to be a, I don't know how you would describe it as a crime scene person. It's almost like a smear. Right. I was going to call it a bunch, but a smear of blood. But there's also other, appears to be other of the same color uh, liquid. Uh, is that also consistent with apparent blood? Yes. And some of these appear to have like, <coughs> like little tails on them, yes. correct? Or is that something that you made sure you took a picture of uh, yes. to notate that particular fact? Yes. Exhibit 39. <coughs> so I'm just taking more pictures of that area. Actually, I have to have it upside down. Looking at exhibit 20, I'm sorry, exhibit 40, placard 20. What are we looking at there? That's apparent blood. I'll we'll kind of jump past 41. And now I'm going to 42. What are we looking at there for the record? So those are markers 21, 22, and 23. And would you show us on the diagram here approximately where that photograph is taken? Uh, about right from here. And it is facing in what direction? Uh, west, towards the hallway. Down the hallway. Right. Exhibit 
Exhibit 21. What are we looking at there? That's a mid-range photograph of that marker. And a, I think that's a fragment. A fragment of some sort, okay. not as opposed to a blood drop or a blood smear. Right. Exhibit 22. Um, that's apparent blood. And exhibit 23. Uh, apparent blood. And that is, it appears to continue kind of in one continuous motion. Yes. This is, I'm sorry, for the record, that was exhibit 45. Exhibit 46. That's just another angle, though, right? Okay. Now, we do have a picture of this, but for the record, when you were at the scene, did you notice, uh, uh, first of all, placard 23 of exhibit 46? Uh, does that placard kind of represent the beginning of that entire uh, blood smear? Yes. Okay. And from what distance for the record, and I don't mean measure distance, but I'm talking about in relation to the hallway, how long did that smear stay on the ground, so to speak? Was that continuous? Yes, all the way to the master bedroom. And the master bedroom? Where would that be in this particular picture? So that would be down here. Right. So the the last doorway, that I'll call it, that we can see with these other placards in here. This this area up here would be the room he pointed to. Yeah. Exhibit forty-seven. Um, what placards are we looking at? Um, that's at the end of that blood smear. Exhibit 49, we have what two placards? 24 and 28. What does 24 uh, show? Uh, here a bullet hole. And, and where would that be? Is that this area here? <coughs> yes. So the blood smear is the continuation of 23 for the most part. 24 is now a bullet hole. And if looking at exhibit 51, what are we looking at there? Uh, marker 28. And what does that show? So that's kind of the end of the blood trail. The blood, the smear. The smear down the hallway. Did the blood continue into the bedroom once uh, it reached the doorway? Yes. And for the record, um, if you would show us on the diagram here, the blood smear kind of started where and ended where? So it started here and went up this way. Okay. And once it reached that point, were you able to document what blood, if any, was in the master bedroom? Was I able to? Yes. yes. Okay, and you were able to photograph that? Yes. Um, we're going to go to, excuse me. Exhibits 52 through 58, and that should take us right up to 10 o'clock. is this photograph looking if we if we have the marker 25 at the foot of the bed so it's going this way okay looking across to the other wall of the bedroom yes now my question for the record is we've seen this this big long smear down the hallway uh, 
which was placard 23 in the prior exhibits. And then at the doorway, that appears to have stopped. Um, looking at exhibit 52, for the record, because we can see it, was there any more blood smear on the floor like there was down the hallway? Yeah. Instead, what type of blood or apparent blood was observed by you in photograph? Blood drops. Looking at Exhibit 53, what are we looking at there? That's apparent blood on the floor with marker 25. All right. And again, the, the type of blood, you've talked about a smear and a drop. In Exhibit 53, what are we looking at? Drops. Exhibit 54, what are we looking at there? Um, now I'm facing toward, I'm in the bedroom facing the hallway. All right. Could so you I'm show us hallway. where you were? So I was probably right here looking this way. So have you seen the, now we're back to the blood smear in the hallway? Yes. And you're kind of just looking at it from a different direction. Yes. Does this exhibit 54 uh, sort of delineate where the smear stopped and when the drops start? Yes. So this is a, a this picture would kind of show where that transition took place. Yes. Exhibit 55, what are we looking at here? So the marker is 26 and 27. And again, what are we looking at as it relates to the markers? Apparent blood. And is that blood a smear or are those drops? Drops. Exhibit 56. Like a closer view of the marker numbers. And the marker numbers for the record are? 26 and 27. Exhibit 57. So these are the same marker numbers, but now I'm looking um, towards the closet. And is there anything of significance in the closet uh, that is documented here in exhibit number 57? Yes. And what is that? The victim. Uh, and what, for the record, are we looking at as far as the portion of the victim? The right foot. And the blood that we, apparent blood that we see in the victim, um, is that, uh, what form is that? Is that a smear or drops? Drops. Now, as far as the drops uh, in this area, are they more or less concentrated than some of the drops we've seen earlier in this bedroom area? Well, there, is it more concentrated in that area? Yes. Okay. Uh, exhibit 58. What are we looking at there? That's just another um, photograph of the same thing. I want to direct your attention to sort of the upper corner, uh, upper left corner of Exhibit 58. Uh, what is this in this area? That's the parent blood. But there's a line. So what, when you look at that from a crime scene investigator standpoint, what is it about documenting that? What does that suggest as far as your experience? Typically it's when blood hits the surface and then just drips down. And is that what we see in that photograph? Yeah. Um, so I'm going to ask you just a couple questions, and I think we're probably at a good point. I believe 10 o'clock is the magic time. Um, you took, and we're up to exhibit 58 now. Um, so essentially we have 58 photographs. There's a couple A's and B's in there, roughly 60 photographs. Uh, but for complete transparency, did you take a lot more photos of these particular areas uh, than we've shown to the jury? <coughs> like how many? Hundreds? Okay, but my question to you is this, um, is this a fair representation of what you saw and the things that you were documenting? Yes. So are there occasions where you would take maybe 10 pictures of the same blood spot? Yes. Okay, but if we use two, we're not hiding anything from anybody. Correct. I and just, I like to have, I would rather have many more than not enough. Okay. 
But again, I'm going back to that fair representation. This is a fair representation uh, within reasonable time limits to show the jury what you photographed and observed yeah. at your time on this crime scene. Yeah. Okay. Um, at this time, I'll, I'll take a break, Judge. All right, ladies and gentlemen, it's 10 o'clock. We'll go ahead and take our mid-morning recess. Please leave your notepads in the chair. All rise, please.
Exhibit 63, what are we looking at there? So that's the exterior side of the door. And the we previously looked at the door jam in the previous exhibit up here. Uh, is this the corresponding edge or latch of the door? Yes. And what is it for the record that appears in this general area where the, I'll call it the striker of the door uh, latch is? A pair of blood. And then this kind of down the side of the door here, what is that? Did that appear to you? It's not apparent to us. Looking at exhibit 64. <laughs> what is that? Um, that's apparent blood. Oh, I can Is that further down on the edge of the door, I guess, the easiest question? Yes. And does it also show the bottom of the closet door? Yes. Uh, maybe a little further close up. I'm going to go back to exhibit 63 for a second. If we look down at this area, we go to exhibit 64. For the record, what are we looking at there? Apparent blood. All right, and this area down here is also apparent blood. Yes. Looking at 65, <clears throat> that little 
closer view? Yes. Same door? Yes. All right. So now we've talked a little bit about the bedroom. We've moved to the closet doorway and what you observed and what you photographed. I'm going to now begin the next series of photographs beginning with 66. Uh, previously, I think you indicated that we saw Ms. Bunce's right uh, foot sticking out of the closet. For the record, what are we looking at in Exhibit 66? So this is going further into the closet, and you can see both of her legs. 67. That's her right foot. And what's the uh, purpose of the ruler? Um, to show size. Exhibit. Now, on that one, the ruler says LH. Was that your backup or the hill? Yes. Exhibit 68. That's another photo of the victim's leg. Exhibit 69. And that's the upper portion of the victim. Now, um, up above on the wall, uh, what did this appear to be um, when you were at the scene? A pair of bullet wounds. Uh, and was that actually collected as well? Yes. So you all cut the portion of the uh, drywall out? Yes. And we'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. Exhibit 70, uh, what are we looking at there? Another angle of the victim. Looking at Exhibit 71, uh, what are we looking at there? Um, apparent blood on the wall. Now, this particular picture, uh, where in the closet are we looking if we look at the victim's hand and we look at this edge of the, uh, of the photograph, the, the left edge of Exhibit 71, where are we looking at in this photo? So you would be looking right here, you so, would be inside the closet kind of looking out, or at least looking at the outside, or the inside door frame of that same closet. Yes. And on the wall, um, tell us what this appeared to be and the reason for the photograph there. Apparent uh, blood, <coughs> it looks smeared. We'll go to Exhibit 72. Um, does Exhibit 72 show that same smeared area as Exhibit 71, but what else does it show? Uh, other areas of apparent blood. Does it also show the proximity of the victim's right hand with regard to that smear on the wall? Yes. Now, there appears to be a series of marks on the center of what appears to be the wall of the closet. What do those, for the record, appear to be? Blood drops. And, and but there, as far as drops, do they have that same Describe what we're seeing here as far as blood drops on the floor look like they're just round. Right, What's those this? are like they're dripping down. Looking at Exhibit 73. That's the apparent bullet hole. Now, around the bullet hole, does there appear to be uh, some other markings or possible substance? There's apparent blood. Okay. Now, this is in a little bit different form than what we've seen. We've seen big drops and we've seen big smears. Right. Uh, this looks a little bit different. Yes. Um, you documented that. Um, is that a type of apparent blood that you've seen before? Yes. Exhibit 74. So this is the victim's abdomen. And was that taken as she laid there uh, as, as far as being in the closet? Yes. Because we have seen some autopsy pictures, but this was actually the her laying there where she was hung. Yes. Did you change her clothing or move anything before this picture was taken that you're aware of? Uh, I think we lifted the shirt. Was that in order to get a picture of these yes. wounds? Now, lifting the shirt up, those wounds, that, that, that blackish shirt would have been pulled down. Yes. And so the wounds, <coughs> well, the shirt being down, those wounds were underneath the shirt. Yes. Um, there appears to be a couple of blue white circles with uh, blue tabs on them. It looks like little snap buttons on them. What are those? Um, that's EMS paraphernalia, medical paraphernalia. That's nothing that you put there? No. Exhibit 75. So this is uh, showing a spent casing on the closet floor. 
right now is this the same closet floor that Ms. Bunce's body was found in? Yes. Exhibit 76. This is a closer photo of the pieces. That is, is that the same one we just saw? Yep. Is that also on the closet floor in the same closet as this one? I believe it's the same one. There were two located in the closet. And we'll get to that in a second. Exhibit 77. What are we looking at there? That looks like um, current jacketing. Exhibit 78. That's a photo of the victim's life. <clears throat> so that, well, and does that all does that show the proximity of that apparent jacketing that we see in '77? I see a, some sort of a, like a piece of a shoe or something shiny at the top. Yeah. If we were go to go into '78, um, does that apparent jacketing appear in there, but sort of a view where you can see the proximity of it? Yeah. 78 maybe should have come first and we zoom into 77. Yeah. Exhibit 80. So um, this is the victim's left arm and left side of the chest. That's another photo of the left arm. And that would be the inside of the left arm? Yeah. And finally, in this series of Exhibit 82, what are we looking at there? That's the palm side <coughs> of her right hand. All right, I'm going to move to the last, I believe, the last set of photographs. Give me a second. Don't get this back. All right. <coughs> I'm going to pick out the ones that we haven't seen. Some of the ones we haven't seen. So let me just make the record clear. All right. Um, so looking at Exhibit 83A, we're kind of heading back out. Where are we looking? Um, this is the interior side of the porch door. And if we look around the deadbolt area or this area right around the handle, what did you observe and photograph? Okay. Um, and this <coughs> door, I think you pointed out, is the, would be the door to the floor room, but this would be the inside of it. Yes. And that would be the deadbolt. Now, these do not have markers, but um, looking at Exhibit 84, um, our last view of that was sort of looking at the floor and seeing what things were on the floor, and you put up placards. Yeah. But prior to that, did you have an opportunity to go through the house and kind of take pictures uh, before you got into the little details that we talked about? Yes. Yeah. All right. And is this an example of one of those um, sort of overall photos? Yes. And, and for the record, what are we looking at? Uh, this is the living room. And exhibit 84A. So that's in the living room. Um, that's the love seat. That would be here. Okay. Now, I'm going to ask you sort of a question. Of, you took a picture of a couch. Um, do you take pictures of... <coughs> pretty much everything, whether or not you know whether they, I mean, obviously apparent blood and jacketings, but do you just take pictures of other things as well, just to document everything that you see? Yes. Okay. So the couch is not necessarily of particular significance. Correct. Maybe. But you don't know. Right. 
So you take pictures of a lot of things. Yes. Exhibit 84B, um, some books on the uh, end table. Yes. Appears to be a lamp, some other things on there. some of these um, that was for the record 84 C 84 D 85 um, what are we looking at in 85 so this is um, in the living room facing the porch um, where are we on the picture there so that would be the right in here and I'm facing the porch okay. 86 that's another photo of the living room. Same, basically the same direction. Yes. 87. That's the dining room. Where is that on the picture? That's over here. Is that the dining room table? Yes. 87. That's the dining room table. Excuse me, 87. 88. That's the dining room going into the kitchen. A. That's the kitchen counter. B. That's another photo of the kitchen. Now, I want to direct your attention to this uh, in the center of the picture on the what appears to be sort of a dining room bar counter type thing. Um, recognize what that was there? The cell phone. All right, is that something that you would collect? Yes. And in this case, did you collect? What's the purpose of collecting the cell phone? Um, the detectives take them and do their thing with them. We just collect them in case they want to go through um, phone calls or text messages or anything like that. Okay. To help perhaps find some evidence on a cell phone. Yeah. And is there a particular way that you collect a cell phone? We put it in a paper bag. And, and is that, that was the paper bag protocol you talked about so that you don't get fingerprints and contaminate it? Yes. So that even though the material on the inside of the phone may be important, is it also important for you to not touch it or contaminate it as well? Yeah. Uh, 88C, what are we looking at there? Um, that's another photo of the kitchen. <clears throat> I'm going to skip a few of these because uh, we've seen them before and they are in evidence. I want to ask you about um, going back through the, this is exhibit 95, uh, where are we here? That's the master bedroom. Right. And the reason I'm asking is because this is a broader view than some of the looking at the floor of the smears. So where is this in the master bedroom from perspective? So I would be standing in this area, photographing that way. Now, the door that we looked at with the door jam, excuse me, the closet door that we looked at with the door jam, the doorknob, <coughs> and where Ms. Bunsen's body was, is that located in uh, the photograph 95, right? Yes. And where, uh, where would that door be, again, in this diagram? Right here. Looking at exhibit 95A, what are we looking at in that exhibit? That's from another angle. Um, Looking into the closet. Okay. And where would you have been in the bedroom to take that photograph? Um, probably over here. And looking in what direction? Towards the closet. Um, but you're not as close uh, so that some of the details here are not maybe as distinct as the other photographs. Right. Now, at some point, was uh, Ms. Bunce's body removed from the closet? Yes. Were you able to go back to the closet and actually kind of take another look in there for the <coughs> evidence would have taken more photographs? Yes. So let me show you exhibit 96. Could you tell us what that is? So that's the floor in the closet. And when Ms. Bunce's body was removed, did you find anything in addition with regard to shell casings? that maybe had been obscured initially. Yes. Okay. And what did you find? Uh, two spent casings and a pair of jackets. Okay. And just so that we're kind of staying in line with our, our 
diagram here. Where was this photograph taken in the closet, the master closet? What, where were you and what was the direction? So I was standing here photographing this way. Okay. So this, this back wall area here uh, would be the, the, it doesn't have a bump out there, but it would be yeah. that back wall. Looking at exhibit 98, um, where are we looking here? So that's the wall she was initially, her hand was leaning against. So was her body partially obscuring some of these blood or apparent blood streaks and things like that just yeah. because of the position of her body? Yeah. So in this instance, you were able to really photograph the whole area without having anything blocked? Yes. Exhibit 99. That's just another view of the, that area. Exhibit 100. What are we looking at there? That's a spent casing. Right. Now, is this a second spent casing that you were able to see after Ms. Bunce's body was removed? Yes. Exhibit 101. So, this is the area with the apparent bullet hole that we cut out that I collected. Um, and that's just showing the apparent bullet hole that went in the metal duct from the wall into the metal duct. And were you able to trace that bullet that went through the wall, through the drywall? Um, in this, right in this area of the center of the picture where the drywall has been cut out, what are we looking at in the center of the picture here? The apparent bullet hole. Right. And this silvery thing in the middle, you said you used the word ductwork? Yeah. Some, some type of metal ductwork in there. And so there was an additional apparent bullet hole from the drywall piece that, did that correspond with the hole in the metal ductwork? Yes. Were you able to sort of trace that uh, bullet path at some point during your investigation? Yes. And where did it continue to? So it continued, um, it exited the hallway wall and then went into the uh, this side of the hallway on the floor. And I think we've seen a marker that yes. when you said there was an apparent uh, bullet marker hole. 24. So let's take a look at that. Uh, looking at exhibit 102, there was a previous marker there. Is, what are we looking at there? So that's um, right here in the hallway <coughs> in the floor. Let's look at exhibit 103. What are we looking at there? That's an apparent little hole which was on the south wall of the hallway. Sort of an exit hole? Yes. Yeah. Right. So let's look at 104 and tell me what we're looking at there. So this is the trajectory rod that I inserted from the wall in here out through the hallway wall into the floor. So uh, something had been parent bullet hole had passed through that closet from the point where uh, it entered the drywall and actually continued through and apparently into the floor. Yes. And this trajectory rod is something that you use in your line of work to help um, determine the direction or path of a projectile? Yes. And basically you stick it through the hole, if it lines up, it's pretty straight. Yeah. And in this case, was it pretty straight? Yeah. All right, now what I'm going to do is I'm going to move us out to the, uh, kind of change our location here and talk about exhibit 105. Can you tell us where that was taken? So it's like a, another porch area. Um, that's the utility Right. So this is, we see some sort of a door, looks like an open screen door here. Um, where would that have been? That would have been right here. Looking at exhibit 105A, uh, what are we looking at there? That's showing the door, the storm door. And is that the same door we're talking about here? Yeah. So that's a separate entrance from the door out front where you had uh, shown us some, some blood on the uh, latch of the de deadbolt there. Right. Yeah. So that's the front door, but what we're looking at here is the one back here. And looking at exhibit 105B, what's the view we're seeing there? That's 
It's showing the screen door for that floor. So the, if we're looking, this is 105B. If we go back to 105A, uh, what is this right here? This little metal? The, um, railing. The hand railing? <clears throat> so if we look at exhibit 105B, can we see that same hand railing but from outside? Yes. Is that located in this area? Yes. Looking at 106. What are we looking at there? That's the Dodge Ram that was on the scene. And where was that? If we look back here, we see a white car, we see apparently a house. Where was this vehicle parked? It I mean, might not fit on the, the map there, but roughly if we were to look, where would that have been? It would have been down here in the roadway. Okay. Uh, and looking at the exhibit 106, what direction was it pointing in? I believe it was facing north. So the uh, this area here, does this represent like the Florida room of the house that you were uh, doing your investigation? Yes. Is this like the kitchen windows here? Yes. So this vehicle was in the front of yes. the house, but facing north? Yes. Uh, 107. Speaking of doors, what door are we looking at there? Um, that is. Tell me if that's the, the front door again. We'll show you the other one. So we're oriented. This is the door down here. Right here. The, port, the front yeah. the floor. Yeah. And what I want to ask you about is immediately to, in the picture, to the right of Exhibit 107, what is this material? What, what are we looking at right here on the side of the door? Screen. Right. And looking at 107A, Maybe that's not a good picture. I'll move to 107. What were you photographing there? Um, a hole in the screen. Um, and that was was that brought to your attention by detectives and or information uh, in the case that that would be something that would be important to document? Yes. Again, you took a picture of a couch, but here's holes in the screen. Right. Theoretically, holes can be in the screen. Right. But as it related to this case, this was something you felt was important to document. I think you can go ahead and have a seat. Thank you so much for standing up. Such a long time. <clears throat> All right. Now, I want to talk to you a little bit about um, the second, call it the second part. I'm just using second as sort of a reference point. You told the jury earlier on, the first thing you do is you take pictures of the scene to document everything, correct? Yes. Uh, and then you label everything with those little placards, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven? Yes. Pieces of evidence that you may want to collect? And then the next thing is to actually collect it. Yes. So what I want to do now is go through the things that you collected and see if, in fact, those are the items that you did uh, collect. And if you have your report, if you need to refer to it, that's fine. Okay. But I want to start off with um, the item that we have seen.
originally, in our first photograph, or at least our first placard, can you see this at all? Yeah. I've kind of got your eyes used to being up here, and now I threw you way up there and you got to look at it. Uh, do you recall testifying that there was a placard, a number one, in the lawn? Uh, I think we talked a little bit about the fact that that showed or mark the location of a cell phone. Yes. All right. So now what I want to do is show you what's previously been marked for purposes of identification in States Exhibit 259 and ask you if you could tell me if you recognize what that is. Yes. And what is it? A cell phone from Martha Warren. And does that have the, uh, you, you've marked, have you, when you collected it, you put it in a plastic, uh, paper bag? Yes. And did you document that that was indeed the item that you found at Marker 1 on the scene? Yes. And that corresponds to the area in the front of the house? Yes. Is that cell phone in substantially the same condition that it was when you recovered it. Yes. This time I'd ask that State <coughs> Exhibit 259 for identification be admitted as a full exhibit. Mr. No objection. It will be received. Now, we're going to move to Exhibit. and Exhibit 4, Exhibit 3 being the photograph of the 9mm Glock. Can you see that from there? Yes. yes. That's why I let you do this up front so you kind of know what these pictures are again, <laughs> right? Um, and then Exhibit 2, which is the also the number 2 placard. Okay. Um, and do you recall what you recovered from that area, uh, if anything? The as it relates to placard number two in that position. The handgun. All right. I'm going to show you, but before I do, I'm going to ask Mr. Larson as the bailiff, the chief bailiff in the courtroom. I'm going to show, uh, for the record, Exhibit 260, but I'm going to ask the bailiff to make sure that that firearm is secure. Okay. Let the record reflect that Mr. Larson has handed this back to me and has indicated that it is secure to present. I want to show you what's previously been identified for purposes <coughs> 260 for identification. And ask if you can identify what that is. Yes. And what is it? A handgun from Marker 2. I'm also going to show you what's previously been marked for purposes of identification at States Exhibit 261. And ask if you can identify what this is. Yes. And what is it? This is the magazine from the handgun. So at the time that this was collected, was the magazine that we have in Exhibit 261 for identification, was that in or as a part of a single unit and installed into the firearm, the Glock handgun, as that's marked 260 for identification? Yes. So was that something that you uh, were either observed or removed yourself to keep them separately? Yes. All right. Uh, but at the time it was collected, that magazine was inserted into the gun? Yes. Right. So even though it's a part now, they are both substantially the same condition as you recovered them. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, and the photograph that we saw in Exhibit 4 and Exhibit 3, um, actually Exhibit 4, was this the condition of the handgun that we see 
in Exhibit 260 for identification. Yes. Does this Exhibit 4 show that the um, <coughs> magazine was inserted into the handle where it normally sits when the gun is in one piece? Yes. And the slide was in this position when you picked the gun up? Yes. This time, um, well, and all of the markings on the paperwork indicate that this is indeed the gun that you, and the magazine that you recovered. Yes. Um, and they are in substantially the same condition. Yes. This time I'd ask that States Exhibit 260 and Exhibit 261 for identification be admitted into evidence as full exhibits. Any objection? No, Your Honor. They will be received. Now, we're kind of going sequentially here. I want to talk to you about moving closer to the house and observing what we talked about as three spent shell casings at markers three, four, and five. Recall that? Yes. And this area here, I think you pointed out originally, was somewhere in this little corner area between the steps and the doorway and the front of the house. Yes. Did you recover each of those shell cases? Yes, I did. And did you collect them and put them in the type of appropriate container or uh, packaging uh, pursuant to uh, your protocol? Yes. So I'm going to show you what's previously been marked for purposes of identification as states exhibits 262, 263, and 264. Um, and I'm going to ask you if you recognize what these are. And we can go one by one if you'd rather. Starting with 262, do you recognize what that is? Yes. What, what is that? This is a spent casing for marker three. So if we were to look up on the board, that's the one furthest to the right? Yes. How about exhibit 263 for identification? This is the spent casing for marker number four. And four, would that be the one we see up there in exhibit five uh, in the center? Yes. And finally, with regard to Exhibit 264 for identification. This is the spent casing from Marker 5. And would we see that closest to the stairway, uh, kind of under that window area? Yes. Are, other than being packaged for court, are all of these items in substantially the same condition as when you retrieved them and then packaged them? Yes. Now, um, at this time, I'd ask that States Exhibit 260. <laughs> 263 and 264 be admitted as full exhibits. Any objection? No objection. They will be received. Now, the um, normally, if these were have been brought into court as you package them, what would we see without be, having been packaged for court? They would be in their box in this bag. So we would see a paper bag. Yes. All right. So as as we see them, we can actually see what they are. I'm going to ask you about we're going to move a little bit further into the house I think you previously indicated that there were a number of things that you collected um, at the time you entered into the house and, and some things were physical and some things I believe you said were swabs yes 
I'm going to show you, <coughs> excuse me, what's previously been marked. Well, first of all, I'm going to put up Exhibit 19 and referring you to the sort of the lower left quadrant. This was a cell phone, uh, a pair of glasses. And I think you indicated this was apparent blood. Yes. Got ahead of myself. Um, I'm going to go back to exhibits nine and ten, which are photographs of placard number eight and placard number nine. Um, these were items that I believe you said were found on the porch at marker nine and marker eight. Yes. All right. So I'm going to show you. Um, What's previously been marked for purpose of identification is State's Exhibit 265 for identification. And ask if you can identify what that is. Yes, that's a parent projectile from marker 8. All right, and as we look at Exhibit 9, the overhead, is that an item that you identified as being? right along the edge of this chair over here on the front porch. Yes. Now I'm going to show you what's previously been marked for purposes of identification as Exhibit 266. You tell me if you recognize what that is. Yes, that's a parent jacketing from Marker 9. So if we look at Exhibit 10 over here, is that the same item that you recovered from that location? Yes. And your testimony was that you believe that that was the piece that was over on this side. Yes. So bullet fragment eight, jacketing nine. Yes. Are both of those items in substantially the same condition as when you retrieved them? Yes. Do they have the uh, label on there where you indicated that you did indeed collect those items? Yes. This time I'd ask that States Exhibit 265 and 266 for identification be admitted as full exhibits. Any objection? No, sir. will be received. I'm going to move to the next area. One I kind of skipped over. This is where I jumped ahead of myself. I'm going to go back to exhibit 10 on the overhead. area uh, that you've indicated there were a couple of things that were collected yes uh, in near this marker 10 so I'm going to show you what's previously been marked for purposes of identification is states exhibit two excuse me 323 267 and 268 ask if you can look at those and identify what those are. Yes. And, and what are they? Uh, the cell phone from marker 10, the apparent tooth, 
that was beneath the cell phone and apparent blood. Okay. Now, uh, when you say apparent blood, are we talking about this area right here? Yes. And when you say cell phone, are you talking about the cell phone here that's depicted in Exhibit 10, uh, 19? Yes. And as far as the tooth, do you talk about the tooth that was recovered right in this area? It was beneath the cell phone. Okay. And actually, if we go to Exhibit 17, the cell phone has been removed? Yes. And in the center of the photograph, would that be the tooth? Yes. Exhibit 19, cell phone, no tooth. Exhibit 17, no cell phone, tooth. Yes. Are the items that you just described there, are they all in substantially the same condition as when you retrieved them from the scene? Yes. And does the paperwork indicate the fact that you did retrieve them from the scene? Yes. This time I'd ask that states exhibit 268, 267, and 323 for identification be admitted as full of the screen. No objection. It will be received. All right. What we're going to do now is take a look. Exhibit 1st well, I'm going to start off with uh, showing you what's previously been marked for purposes of identification of States Exhibit 269. from marker 11, a projectile and jacketing from marker 12, and <clears throat> a pair of eyeglasses from marker 14. So I've got this split up, the, the numbers split right between the exhibit numbers, so I have to kind of use both groups. Um, as far as the projectile from marker 12, uh, looking at exhibit 6, is that the same marker 12 that we see uh, right inside of that door? Yes. And looking at Exhibit 12 is the blood, apparent blood swab from um, marker 11. Is that the location of the area that we see in um, that particular Exhibit 6 uh, indicated by the placard? Yes. And then finally, looking at Exhibit Sixteen. Um, you indicated there were uh, glasses found in that area. I'm yes. sorry, fourteen. Yeah. We got the system. Um, exhibit twenty-six. I apologize. The glasses that were found at exhibit. Uh, <coughs> Placard 14, Exhibit 26, those are the same items? Yes. Are they all in substantially the same condition uh, as when you recovered them? 
Yes, they are. Does the paperwork indicate that these are indeed the items you collected on the day that you investigated this case? Yes. When we talk about the blood swab, is this uh, the type of thing you talked about where you actually take a swab from the uh, suspected blood on the floor? Yes. And you package it in this fashion? Yes. This time I'd ask that States Exhibit 324, 258, and 269 for identification be admitted as full exhibits. Any objection? Yes, sir. You received. got toward the center of the living room area after marker 14 did you collect other items um, in relation to this case toward the center of the room yes as soon as the defense has had a chance to look at those I'm going to show you those items I'm going to show you what's previously been marked for purposes of identification at States Exhibit 270, 325, 271, 272, and 273. And if you could look at those and tell me if you recognize what they are. Yes. Let's start with. The first one. Um, apparent jacketing from marker 15. Apparent blood from marker 16. Right, well, slow down now. You're going to oh, fast All right. So if we were to look at um, exhibit 24. <clears throat> Uh, do we see marker number 15? Yes. And is that the area in which you recovered that apparent jacketing? Yes. Go ahead and move to the next one now. Uh, apparent blood from marker 16. Looking at exhibit 27 in the center of the room on the carpet, is this the area where uh, that was collected? Yes. And again, for purposes of the record, when you say collected, you actually use a swab in that area to uh, collect some potential <coughs> blood or apparent blood. Yes. Okay. What's the next item? Um, apparent bullet fragment from marker 17. And if we look at exhibit 27, is that the item that is uh, indicated by placard number 17 in the sort of the center of the room area? Yes. And how about the next item? Um, apparent jacketing from marker 18. We're going to go back to exhibit 27. Is that jacketing of that area is delineated here by the placard found in um, 18 in exhibit 27? Yes. And then um, apparent bullet fragment from marker 21. Right. Looking at exhibit 36, that location <coughs> of placard 21, that would be the location that that was recovered. Yes. Are each of those items that you just referred to and that we've kind of seen uh, on the uh, photographs that you took that depict sort of this central area of the house, are each of those in substantially the same condition as when you recovered them? Yes. Did each one of them indicate on the paperwork that you were indeed the individual that did recover that? Yes. And other than having been packaged for the court and the jury to see them, they are in substantially the same condition? Yes. This time I'd ask that exhibits 270, 271, 272, 273, and exhibit 325 be admitted 
Any objection? No objection. They will be received. Specifically, um, if you had recovered any of those items from the counter. Remember that? Yes. And you indicated that there was a cell phone that you recovered. Yes. Right. And I think you testified that you packaged it a certain way, but in addition to the content, you're always also looking for potentially any DNA or things of that nature on the outside. Yes. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you what has previously been marked for purposes of identification as States Exhibit 88D, as in Delta. I'm going to ask you to take a look at that. Do you recognize what it is? Yes. What is it? Um, it's a cell phone that was on the counter in the kitchen. So if I was to put up exhibit 88C uh, and point to this area in the lower right corner on the kitchen counter area, yes. would that be the item that you recovered uh, that we previously, well, that you're looking at right now? Yes. Okay. So that item corresponds to this location. Yes, it does. Uh, there's no placard on this particular item like we've seen on some of the other ones. Is there any particular reason for that? Um, sometimes we don't mark every item. Um, I was trying to make a path through the house into the bedroom and that was on the kitchen counter. So um, they later said they wanted to collect it. So I had already laid out my numbers and had already photographed. And so I just collected it from the kitchen counter instead of marking it. So does that in any way compromise what you did as far as collecting and documenting what it was? No. So the, the placard isn't a deal breaker? No. It, 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 but it's convenient. Yes. Right. But you can tell the jury that this phone that you uh, have here that's been previously been marked for purposes of identification is the state's exhibit. 88 Delta. That is the same phone that we see uh, in the photograph that I put up yes. of the kitchen. It is. Is it in substantially the same condition as when you got it? Yes. All right. And uh, the paperwork indicates that you were indeed the person that recovered this item? Yes. This time I'd ask that states exhibit 88 Delta for identification to be admitted as a full exhibit. So you read. If you can take a look at these and tell me if you recognize what they are. Yes. And what are they? Uh, pure blood from marker 23. Okay. And hang on right there. Is that, if we look at exhibit 42, is that the item that we see there as 
placard number 23. Yes. I think you described that as that's the blood smear that goes kind of all the way down the hallway? Yes. All right. What else? Uh, pure blood from marker 26. And looking at Call the location of that 26. If you look at your notes. Yes, that was in the bedroom. Right. Was that one of the markers that was near the uh, closet door? Yes. So if we were to look at exhibit. Marker 26? Yes. Okay, so that blood swab would have been collected at that location there? Yes. Are both of those items in substantially the same condition? Oh, you got one more. Sorry, go ahead. Um, if here is blood from the exterior doorknob and the closet door. All right. And we, we grab another set here. We talked a little bit about the blood on the door jam and on the doorknobs. Um, is that the area around the closet door uh, that we talked about uh, where Miss Bunce's body was? Yes. This is the exterior doorknob. And if I was to show you exhibit 95A, looking at the closet door, would that be this doorknob on the which would be the outside of the closet? Yes. So that's where that swab would have been taken from. Correct. Are all of those exhibits, uh, those three exhibits, in substantially the same condition as when you collect them? Yes. And are each of them, uh, the paperwork associated with those, are they uh, indicated, in, indicative that you are the one that indeed did collect those? Yes. This time that I would ask that states exhibit 326, 327, and 328 for identification be admitted as full of Any objection? No objection. It will be received. We talked earlier about, and we're kind of moving forward into the crime scene now into the closet. Uh, you indicated that you recovered a couple of spent casings and uh, an apparent jacket in, in that area. Yes. Is that correct? Yes. In just a minute, I'm going to show you a couple of exhibits. I'm going to ask you about those. showing you what's previously been marked for purposes of identification the state's exhibit 274, 275, and 276. If you could take a look at those and tell me if you recognize what they are. Yes. Uh, there's a spent casing from the uh, east side of the closet floor. And what else? Parent jacketing from uh, the floor of the closet and a spent casing also from the closet floor. And each one of those items, did you document those? And we've seen pictures of the jacketing and the two spent casings. Yes. And is this the closet area, for example, showing in 296? Uh, there's a spent casing, I believe you testified to, toward the center. Are those, that's the other casing and the jacketing that was found? A couple of which were under Ms. Bunce's body. They were in the closet floor area. Right. Yes. But this is the same closet that we're talking about right here where her body was found. Yes. 
Are each of those exhibits in substantial the same condition as when you collected them, other than perhaps being packaged for court? Yes, they are. And is the paperwork indicative of the fact that you were the individual that did indeed retrieve those items? Yes. This time I'd ask that states exhibit 274, 275, 276 be admitted as full exhibit. No objections. They will be received. for purposes of identification as Exhibit 319. And I'd apologize for handing you a big thing, but you put it in there, so. <laughs> um, do you recognize what that is? Yes. All right, and I'm not going to put a picture up because I think we know what that is. Yes. What is it? It's a piece of drywall that gets turned bullet hole. All right, and this was, we've seen this in a photograph in one of the exhibits as the kind of the back or the side wall of the uh, closet yes. where Ms. Bunce's body was Above found. Head. And this is the one where once you removed this, you were able to put the tra trajectory rod through the, the closet and into the hallway. Well, I did that before I removed it. But. Right, okay. Um, is it in substantially the same condition as when you uh, retrieved it? Yes. And does the paperwork associated with it indicate that you are indeed the person that took off the site? This time I'd ask that states exhibit 319 for identification be admitted as a case at this point. No objection. It will be received. Several times at this front porch door, I think we saw a couple of pictures um, of the door open, partially open, and an area that showed the deadbolt. You recall that? Yes. So I'm going to put up exhibit 5A again. Looking at the the front door is a deadbolt area right up in here. And I want to show you what's previously been marked for purposes of identification as Exhibit 322 and ask if you can identify what that is. Yes. And what is that? That's uh, apparent blood from the deadbolt on the interior door. And is that, but that's a swab? Yes. And is that taken from what we see in Exhibit 5A, that interior deadbolt uh, area? Yes. All right. Is it in substantially the same condition as when you packaged it? Yes. The paperwork indicate that you were the other person that uh, logged this in? Yes. So I might ask that States Exhibit 322 for identification be admitted as a full exhibit. Any objection? No, sir, Your Honor. It will be received. <clears throat>
right. I just made sure everyone didn't have to hand you anything else here for a little bit. Um, everything that you did to process this scene and collect this evidence, uh, was that all done in the fashion that you have done uh, in accordance with the Sheriff's Office uh, protocol that you've worked with for many years? Yes. Um, and just so that we're clear, the items that you collect, um, you don't, or, or do you have any input on what item gets tested or evaluated subsequent to you packaging it? No. Whose responsibility is that typically? Uh, typically it's the lead detective. Uh, um, as far as the amount of items that you collect, uh, that you photograph, um, We've already talked that you've taken a lot more photographs than we've shown the jury. I think you indicated it was a fair representation. Yes. Um, but as far as the, the processing of a crime scene, do you do as thorough a job as you possibly can right up front? Yes. Um, what's the purpose of that? Because you don't want to lose any evidence or you can't go back. And redo it. So. so you kind of have that one time to, to get it right. Yes. So uh, sometimes you collect things that may not necessarily be of evidence. <coughs> yes. But at the time you're there, do you have any idea what is or what might not be evidence? Mm -hmm. I mean, blood spatter, <coughs> projectiles, those are probably the easy ones to call. Right. Yeah. But as far as any other items that, that you don't know about, it's simply a matter of being as thorough as you can. Yes. And in this case, you you did that? Yes. Um, and you indicated that you did have other uh, crime scene folks there to help you as well? Yes. And as far as you've worked with them for many years? Yes. They follow the same rules that you do? Yes. We didn't talk about this in the beginning, but over the past 23 years, how many crime scenes would you say you have processed? But the record reflects she's giving me the big stare. <coughs> it's hard to speculate. Hundreds, probably. Okay. Hundreds. Okay. So you've done this a lot. Yeah. Thank you very much. I have no further questions. Yeah. I'll, let, I'll let you decide whether you <coughs> think. Um, before a reasonable lunch hour, or whether we should take a lunch recess early? Uh, I think a reasonable, are you talking about 12 o'clock? Well, around, well, around 12 o'clock. I think I can do it. <coughs> you may proceed with props. Thank you. Good morning. So as the, as the state indicated, you've been doing this for, did you testify, about 23 years? I've been at the sheriff's office 23 years. And you've been a crime scene investigator for about how many years? About 18 years. 18 years. And you were the lead crime scene investigator in this case? Yes. All right. And would you agree with me uh, that you had arrived on scene about 4.50 in the morning? I arrived, um, I responded at 4.50, I arrived at 5.20. Okay, so you responded at 4.50 and you arrived on scene at? 5.20. 5.20. So that would have been roughly over four hours after the uh, incident at 373 Melbourne um, Drive had occurred. Yeah, I don't, I don't know the exact time that the call came in. Sure. Um, <clears throat> when you either were dispatched or you arrived on scene or something in between, were you given the allegations about what had allegedly occurred at that residence? Uh, when I got to the scene, <coughs> I made contact with my supervisor and she advised me of the situation. And who was your supervisor? Uh, Kendra. Uh, crime scene tech? Uh, no, she's, she was a supervisor. Okay. So a sergeant? Something mm -hmm. different? They don't use those titles for the civilians? Sure. 
but she was, well, actually at that time she was the administrator, so. All right, so supervisor is the highest level supervisor in our unit. And you bring, bring up a good point. Crime scene technicians are not deputized, they're not deputies, correct? Correct. They're civilians. Yes. All right. Um, I'd like to talk to you about the, um, the spent casings <coughs> that were found. So I want to show you what's been entered as state's exhibit number five. In that photograph, you see markers three, four, and five, right? Yes. And prior to your um, marking these specific areas, do you know whether or not anything in that area had been moved by prior deputies accidentally? No, I don't know. Okay. And with regards to marker number three, that would have been a spent casing, which was a CBC nine millimeter casing, correct? Yes. Okay, and if I can publish Would you agree with me that that spent casing is a brass casing? Um, I don't know for sure. I have no idea. Which exhibit is that? This is exhibit, I'm sorry, uh, 262. Yes. Yes. I mean, it is a brass casing. Yes. Okay. And then with regards to marker five and six, which would be exhibit 263 and 264. Would you agree with me that those casings are not brass, but of some other metal? Yes. Probably aluminum. I, I don't hear. Okay. But they're not brass. <laughs> Permission to publish. So markers five and four are not brass casings. Correct. Correct. And once again, you you when you collected these these casings, you had no idea whether or not they had been moved accidentally or otherwise. Correct. <coughs> now you also testified that you had collected. I think it was two casings in the closet in the master bedroom. Yes. 
does your report collect reflect that you collected two casings or one casing? Two. What page would that be? That is on. Page 24. Right, let me just go back to the, the casings. Um, the, the aluminum casings or the silver uh, and color casings, those are a different brand of ammunition. Would you agree? Yes. Than the brass casing? Yes. All right. And then the two in the closet. You said 24, <coughs> I'm sorry. Yes, page 24 for the second paragraph. The second paragraph, I'm sorry, if you could direct me because I, um, I... Right beneath the um, bullet markings, not the first paragraph, but the second one. Gotcha, okay, fair enough. So you collected two spent casings in the closet of the bedroom? Yes. All right. And one of those casings, which would be State's Exhibit 274, which would have been a CBC 9 millimeter casing, which would have been a brass casing? Yes. All right. And then... The other one, the 276, would have been an FC 9mm casing, which would not have been brass. Correct. Permission to publish. So once again, these two casings are not of the same metal. One's brass, one's something else. Yes. Probably aluminum, but we don't know. <laughs> and would it also be fair to say that when you collected these casings, you did not know whether or not they had been moved. Correct. All right. And would you also agree with me that you're not a an expert in blood pattern analysis? Correct. I've seen a lot of it through the years, but I'm not an expert. Now you also talked about various swabs and the state introduced various swabs that were taken of blood at the scene, right? How many, how many swabs did you take in the crime scene, would you say? Hmm. You want me to count through my sure. quite a few. <laughs> uh, let me see. One second. Eighteen swabs? Yes. I'm sorry, what was the number of swabs you took? 18. 18 swabs of various um, doorknobs, apparent blood on the carpet, apparent
parent blood on the floor and then blood, parent blood on the walls and things of that nature inside the residence, right? Yes. Yeah. Did you ever take a swab of the, the doorknob or the latch on the door leading into that, that second doorway in the um, screened in area, not the lanai or the, the Florida room, right. but the other, the other door. No. Did you ever take a swab of the door handle on the storm door? No. <clears throat> And I think you had testified on direct that you take and you took hundreds of photographs, right? Yes. And you take hundreds of photographs, not only to document the general scene itself, right? Yes. But then you also take photographs to document specific items that you believe are of evidentiary value. Yes. And this is State's Exhibit 84B. I'm going to turn that up upside down. This photograph was taken by yourself, correct? Yes. And this is a photograph of a book that was found inside the residence that says, or is titled, After You Shoot. Yes. Right? Yes. Okay. So, all right. And then you also took a photograph, and this is going to be Exhibit 84C, a photograph of another book, but which, which was under that initial book that you took, which is titled Basic Pistol Operation and Firearm Safety, right? Yes. <coughs> And then A4D, State's Exhibit A4D, which was another book under that second book, right, which yes. is titled Your First Gun, right? Yep. Now, you also collected a cell phone that was actually two cell phones, right, in the residence. I think there were three. Were there three? Okay. Um, two in the residence and one <coughs> in the vehicle? Or uh, something different? One was outside, one was on the porch, and one was on the kitchen counter. Thank you, yes. One in the grass, right? Yes. And then two inside the uh, residence. Yes. Did you also notice the... Um, the two laptops that were on the kitchen table? Yes. Inside the residence? Yes. Were those collected? No. <clears throat> Did you know that Miss Sanda Andrews had a cat? No. If you had to look through the photographs that were taken by yourself, would you, would that refresh your recollection as to whether or not there was anything that would have indicated to you that she had a cat? I recall when I was reviewing my photographs for trial, I saw a litter box. Okay. Which would be indicative of someone having a cat, right? Yes. <clears throat> you taught or how are you <coughs> trained to pack a cell phone? Um, 
We put them in paper bags. Okay, so you put them in paper paper bags, and then where do they go? Uh, then we either send them to our property section, or the detective um, retrieves them from our office. We have a locker that we keep them in um, that they pick them up from. And then the the diagram that was being utilized by yourself, which is very helpful um, in this case. Is this a diagram that, that you helped create? No. Did you create a diagram <coughs> with, with measurements? Um, I created a diagram of the interior and the exterior. And how is the diagram that you created different than this diagram, which is exhibit, just, it's not introduced. 109, excuse me, 109. Um, my diagram just has the, where the markers were. Okay, so your diagram has the markers. What about the measurements that you took of the um, various projectiles, uh, bullet fragments, uh, jacketings from the casings, casings, and other items of evidentiary value? Those are listed in my report. Those are listed in your report? You mean the measurements? The measurements. So when you say that you created another diagram, your diagram did not consist of any of the measurements that you took. Correct. <clears throat> Were you asked to create a diagram with those measurements? No. Is that something that you ordinarily would do in a homicide investigation? Um, we normally create sketches of the scene, which I did two of them. Okay. And when you take those measure measurements, and it appears that you took measurements in the porch, right? Yes. Or the, the Florida room? Yes. The, um, the living room, right? Yes. And you can refer to your report if you... If you if you need to. Um, the dining room? Yes. The hallway? Yes. The master bedroom? Yes. The kitchen? Yes. <clears throat> a nondescript room? Yes. And what do you, what's a not, what was the nondescript room? Because I didn't know what it, what to call it. I wasn't, it wasn't really like a foyer to me, so I just called it a nondescript room. <clears throat> okay. And then a bathroom as well? Yes. And a bedroom? Another bedroom? Yes. Did you also take photographs of that that other bedroom? Yes. Photographs inside the other bedroom? Yes. Do you know how many square foot this, this residence was? No. Like how big it was? It was a double wide, but that's all I, I don't know, the square footage. Okay, thank you. Are you right? Quick question. Um, <clears throat> we looked through a lot of photographs and a lot of rooms and uh, closets. <clears throat> My question is, other than the Glock firearm that you found and collected at marker number two and the casings and fragments that we talked about, did you find any other firearm in the property of the, of the address of seven, 373 Melbourne Drive? No. Did you find any firearm holster? At that address? No. Did you find any other ammunition that was maybe new in a box? No. Did you find any clips, magazines? No. Nothing at all? No. Nothing. Thank you. Is this witness released? Yes. 
I just have some brief questions. Thank you. Okay, I'll allow additional cross Mr. Uh, redirect to Mr. Jones. <clears throat> We, we, we talked about how you had arrived on scene. It was probably four, almost five hours after the fact, right? I'm assuming. I don't know what time sure. the call came in. If the call came in about 1.12 in the morning and you arrived, or dispatch, I can't recall, 5.20, I think you got actually got to the scene? Yeah. Okay. Um, you don't know what happened inside the residence, outside the residence, prior to your arrival, right? Correct. All right. But you did take swabs of the hands on some of the victims. No. You did not? No. You are right. Tracy Lynn Wright. Are you talking about the GSR kit? Yes. Oh, the GSR, yes. Okay. What's GSR? Yeah. So those are little stubs and on the lid is a sticky pad. And we dab each hand with the, and it's supposed to pick up the medical particles or anything from the gunshot residue. So we don't do actually swabbing, they're the, just the, the stubs. Yeah. <coughs> Did you take these swab stubs? Um, <coughs> whiskey swabs. Swabs of the, of, of both victims, meaning uh, Lisa Bunce and Sanda Andrews, or just Sanda Andrews? No, I did the victim because she was, uh, the other victim was not at the scene. Okay, so which victim, which person are we talking uh, about? Do you Lisa recall? Bunce. Okay. Do you know whether or not GSR gunshot residue was taken from uh, Sanda Andrews? I don't know. That would have been someone else if that had been done. Yes. Fair enough. Thank you. Any redirect? I have no redirect. Ms. Toomey, is the witness released? I'm, yes, Judge. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Ladies and gentlemen, it is noon. We will go ahead and take our lunch in an hour. Please report back at one o'clock. All right, Witnesses, but I, I may cut it to two depending on how long they go. Um, so we we'll have a, a quote full day. Um, but I also one of the witnesses I was going to give Mr. Levine for tomorrow. Okay. So if we were, it was three thirty as opposed to pushing it to four thirty, and then the, the day tomorrow we may be able to pull it. Um, can we talk about that? I know in the beginning. When this, when you found out you weren't going to be here tomorrow, you talked about maybe making it a short day. Has that decision been made? I'd like to let the jurors know if they needed to make any appointment late afternoon or do something like that. That tomorrow would be a good day. I'll make my comment, but then I'll have Mr. Levine chime in. My understanding, what we've done is we've uh, assembled two or three witnesses that Mr. Levine will handle. One was was fairly lengthy-ish, like Ms. Wright. Um, and I believe that will take us to pretty much a good half day. That being said, Mr. Levine is handling those witnesses, so I'll let him make the final call on that. Mr. Levine? I don't think it'll go past lunch, Your Honor. I mean, we'll be done by lunch. With all three witnesses? Yes. Um, and if you would let Ms. Toomey know who those are so she can also tell us that she thinks we would be done by lunch. You don't have to do that in front of me, but just during the lunch hour. 
Um, because if you think we'll be done lunch, one o'clock, something like that, I want to let them know they can make plans accordingly for tomorrow afternoon. Yes, it looks like we'll be done before lunch or by lunch so that they'll be All right. done for lunch in the afternoon. <laughs> Okay. Do you already know who the witnesses are, Mr. I believe they're just crime scene techs, if I'm correct. I don't believe it's the, the, the lead detective or the main detective. Is that right? It? No. Okay. Just discuss it over yeah, lunch we'll, and then we'll tell her. And then you can tell me after lunch if you think we'll also be done by lunch. Yes, sir, Judge. Anything we need to take up before lunch? Not from the state. <clears throat> no, you're not. All right. We'll see you at one o'clock. <clears throat>
State, call your next witness. Thank you, Your Honor. The, sign, the state calls crime scene investigator Michelle Peters. <clears throat> yourself to the jury. Michelle Peters, a forensic investigator with the Polk County Sheriff's Office um, for almost 20 years. And what does a forensic investigator do? We respond to uh, numerous different types of calls, anywhere from um, a burglary to a homicide or murder. Um, photograph, collect evidence, um, package evidence, write reports, testify in court. And during your 20 some years at the sheriff's office, have you had an opportunity to respond to countless homicide investigations? Yes, sir. All right, I wanna direct your attention particularly to January 5th of 2019. Uh, at around 6, 10 in the morning, did you have an opportunity to respond to the, the Bureau of Criminal Investigations? Yes, sir. And tell the jury a little bit about what, what takes place at that location. Um, it's actually part of the main sheriff's office. It's where the detectives' office are, offices are, um, along with crime scene offices, forensic offices. At that time, was the suspect, who's now the defendant, David Murdoch, was he in custody? Uh, yes, sir. And the case agent, Sergeant Tan, who at that time was Detective Tan, did he request that you respond to the location where the defendant was located? Yes, sir. Did you have an opportunity to see the defendant on that early morning? I did. And did you have an opportunity to take buckle swabs from the defendant? I did. If you could tell the jurors about what, what are buckle swabs and how do you actually take them from an individual? Uh, buckle swab uh, mainly starts out with um, a Q-tip, but it's only got the cotton on one end. It's a long stick. Um, and what we do is the packages are sealed um, and we open the glove up, open those packages, swab one side of the cheek, we put it in an envelope. We then take another closed package, pull those um, swabs out, and swab the opposite cheek, and put that in a separate envelope. Is the goal to obtain somebody's DNA, a DNA sample from that, that can later be sent to the Florida <clears throat> Department of Law Enforcement for any comparisons or analysis? Yes, sir. And did, in this particular case, did you swab both the left cheek and the right cheek of the defendant? I did. And did you follow all the procedures to ensure the integrity of the evidence? Yes, sir. Now, I want you to take a look at two exhibits, particularly in front of you, 321 and 321A. Do those represent the swabs you took from the defendant? Yes, sir. And if you could take a look as well at State Exhibit 329, while you were with Mr. Murdoch, did you also swab his hand? Yes, sir. And what was the purpose of that? Um, there appeared to be uh, apparent blood on his palm of his right hand, and, and we swabbed that and collected it. And how do you accomplish swabbing someone's hand? Similar, similar to the way we do a buckle swab, we use the same type of Q-tip. Um, because the substance is usually at that point dry, we take distilled water, we drop um, a couple of drops on the end of the Q-tip, and then we rub whatever area we're trying to obtain the sample from, and then it would go into an envelope also. Now, did you also have an opportunity to take photographs of the defendant? I did. So is it a fair statement that the photographs captured how he looked on the, the morning of the crimes? The morning that I took those photographs, yes, sir, that's how I observed him initially. <clears throat> At 
approach, please, Ron. <clears throat> Thank you. CSI wrote in, if you could take a look at these photographs in the form of Exhibit 406 through 409. Yes, sir. Are those the photographs that he took of the defendant on January 5th of 2019? Yes, sir. Ron, at this time, the state would move those exhibits 406 through 409 into evidence. Any objection? No objection. No. They will be received. And if I may publish those you may. to the jury, Your Honor, thank you. <coughs> the state would also move in 321 and 321A, the swabs. Any objection? No, sir, Your Honor. They will be received. We'll begin with 406. <clears throat> Is that how the defendant was dressed when you first came in contact with him? Yes, sir. Number 407. Is this close up of his face? 408. Got a close up of the defendant's hands. And then on 409, can you see on his left hand what appears to be blood? <clears throat> yes, sir. So at a later time, at a later time, if it's determined that law enforcement and or the state attorney's office would like some DNA analysis done. Are the swabs that you took then sent to FDLE? Uh, yes, sir, the detective would make that decision and then he would uh, make arrangements for that to be done. All right, CSI Peters, that's all the questions I have for you, thank you. Okay. Thank you, Ross. Good afternoon. All right, so um, you took swabs from Mr. Murdoch's hands, right? Yes, ma'am. And you had indicated that they were apparent, there was apparent blood on his hands, right? Uh, yes, ma'am. And that's the reason that you took these swabs? I believe I took swabbings. Um, <clears throat> I took swabbings from his left and right hand, and then I took a swabbing of apparent blood from one of his hands also. And did you also take swabs or swabbings from the uh, gray plaid shorts that he had on as well? I don't believe I took swabbings from them. I believe I used, um, I took the actual shorts in, um, uh, I took the back, I'm sorry, correction, I did. I actually used uh, a chemical that we used to uh, check for the presence of apparent blood um, with <clears throat> negative results. With negative results? Yes, ma'am. Did you also test the swabs on his, uh, did you say the left hand, I think you said? I did not test the swabs, no, ma'am. Those are what's sent to FDLE at that point. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. You're welcome. Are you ready? No, thank you. Is this witness uh, released? Yes, sir. Ms. Jimmy? <clears throat> yes, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Next witness. Dr. Stephen Nelson. Please tell the jury your name. I'm Dr. Stephen Nelson. And um, what do you do for work? I'm the chief medical examiner for Polk Hardy and Highlands Counties. And um, as the chief medical examiner, could you explain to the folks in the jury a little bit about what that means or what that is? 
We're responsible under uh, Florida law to certify violent traumatic death, uh, typically, and uh, also I have administrative budgetary responsibilities for the office. We serve three counties, Polk, Hardy, and Highlands. And as the District 10 medical examiner, could you give a brief overview of your educational background in order to perform this job? You have to be a physician, an MD, uh, trained in pathology, which is the laboratory side of medicine. Uh, I have uh, subspecialty training in uh, anatomic pathology, which is the hospital laboratory, as well as in forensic pathology, which is the medical examiner work, and another fellowship in neuropathology, which is uh, diseases of the brain, spinal cord, peripheral nerve, muscle, and eye. And how long have you been uh, the chief medical examiner here for the tennis? Since 1996, 1997. And in the course of your career, uh, would it be fair to say that you've done quite a number of autopsies? Thousands. Um, have you also uh, rendered professional uh, opinions as to the manner and cause of death throughout your career in courts of the Tenth Circuit? Yes. <clears throat> so, what I want to do now is ask you to explain a little bit about what an autopsy is or what it means so the folks in the jury can understand a little bit about what you do. Uh, autopsy comes from the uh, Latin and Greek words of auto meaning self and opsy meaning to see. So it's literally the post-mortem dissection of a dead person to determine why they died. Bless you. All right. And does that autopsy, uh, is there a particular protocol or a, or a, a, a list or a, a form, form, formula that you follow when you do every autopsy? Pretty much. Uh, autopsies have been around since, I want to say, probably the 15, 1600s. Uh, so it's probably not changed all that much uh, in how we do things. But uh, yes, we do a, a pretty much of a rote type uh, procedure time after time. And, and give us just a kind of, again, a thumbnail sketch of what is that procedure? How does it start and how does it end? We, uh, we first uh, take uh, copious photographs. Uh, anybody has any type of penetrating uh, injury in their body, such as gunshot wounds, uh, we take x-rays uh, of the uh, person. And then we do our uh, incisions on the body uh, to gain entrance uh, into the body and to track what, in this particular case, what the bullets have done, uh, as well as to recover certain specimens that we're going to use for toxicology analysis. And in this particular case, you, did you have an opportunity to perform an autopsy on an individual named Lisa Lorraine Bunce? Yes. When was that autopsy conducted? Uh, Monday, January 7th, 2019. And if you could um, go through uh, how or what that autopsy consisted of and your findings? Uh, we start with an external examination, very similar when you go to the uh, doctor's office. Uh, doctor will weigh you, measure you, uh, hot air color, eye color, uh, things such as that. We make notes of, of that. We also make notes of the trauma that we find on the body. Again, in this case, uh, multiple gunshot wounds. And uh, then we do uh, photographs, uh, line drawings. So we build a system of redundancy into our files so that if photographs disappear, we still have our line drawings uh, that we've done. We also have dictation that we do with uh, voice recognition software. And when we're done doing all that, uh, we make those uh, internal incisions and examine each of the uh, body organs one at a time, as well as <coughs> the body cavities one at a time. And in regard to uh, Ms. Bunce, uh, could you kind of walk us through what you observed as far as the uh, wounds, uh, you indicated gunshot wounds. Uh, what was it that you found with regard to the gunshot wounds in this case? Uh, she has a, a number of uh, gunshot wounds uh, to her body, to her right hand, her left arm, her left chest, and her right buttocks. Uh, she also has the uh, uh, signs of having been resuscitated. She's got EKG pads, I believe, on her body. And uh, also, for uh, someone who's uh, 56 years of age, she's got uh, normal types of uh, changes associated with atherosclerosis, hardening of the arteries. Or, okay, hardening of the arteries. Um, so take us through the gunshot wound. Um, you have categorized or classified them as A through uh, D. 
Um, starting with gunshot wound A, uh, tell us a little bit about your findings in that. <clears throat> so gunshot wound uh, A is on the right hand, and it uh, goes through the hand. It uh, produces uh, trauma to the uh, muscles that control uh, the thumb. Uh, no fractures to the bones of the hand, surprisingly. Uh, and no projectile is, uh, no, no bullet is recovered. But the uh, wound in anatomic, in anatomic position is uh, standing erect, palm side forward. So in this particular case, it comes from the back of the palm to the front and out through the front of the palm, slightly upward in its trajectory and uh, slightly from the left side to the right side. Right. I'm going to show you what's previously been introduced into evidence as Exhibit 245. Uh, I mean, my first question is, can you see that from where you're sitting? Yes. All right. And is that a, uh, uh, a depiction or an accurate depiction of what you just described about the wound coming from the, uh, on the right hand, coming from the back to the forward? To yeah, the it's between the, uh, the web of the thumb and the index finger. And going to exhibit 246. Um, on the base of the hand here below the little finger is a large stellate laceration that is the exit wound of that. And all of the pink material, the red material on the palm of the hand is blood. But it's this large wound here on the uh, base of the uh, little finger, or the base of the thumb rather, that uh, is the exit wound. And then looking at Exhibit 247, this is a, would appear to be a, a little bit more cleaned up. Yes, uh, exactly. Really. Same, same view. Uh, it's the base of the thumb, and that's the exit wound. Now, this area of the body in the, in the palm of the hand, <coughs> is that an area that is, uh, contains, uh, well, to what extent does that area contain uh, capillary or uh, you know, blood flow? It's got uh, blood flow just like uh, any other part of the body. Okay. Uh, it's, it's got uh, blood flow there in the, uh, in the hand. Is, is this an area, and we did see the picture before this was cleaned up, that if a person sustained this type of a wound, that there would be a significant amount of bleeding from a wound of this type? Sure. What's the type of damage? Now, you indicated that it didn't hit any structure like the bones. No, it didn't hit any structure like the bones, but it has hit uh, multiple muscles there that control the... Uh, thumb as well as uh, the uh, fingers, the first uh, finger. So thumb is, uh, thumb is the first uh, finger, index is the second finger. So these, uh, this damage from this bullet controls the muscles that move the uh, thumb and uh, index finger. And is this, again, we're, we're creating a record, uh, but if this is a wound that an individual would, it's in an area where there's nerves where an individual would feel this? Absolutely. All right, going to uh, the next wound that you've identified in your report, gunshot wound B. Uh, tell us what your findings are and the location of that. It's present on the uh, back and uh, front part of the left arm. So this is the arm from the elbow to the shoulder is the arm. From the elbow to the wrist is the forearm. So this wound is up on the uh, left arm. So on the left arm, and it's about uh, halfway up there. It uh, produces damage to the biceps and triceps muscle. It does not produce a fracture to the uh, uh, humerus, which is the bone here of the arm. Uh, and then it exits the, the left arm. So if I show you exhibit 248. Um, yes. Uh, are we seeing that uh, the example or the, the actual photograph of what you've described as gunshot wound B in your report? Yes, you can actually see the entrance, which is the furthest one to the right, the exit, which is to the uh, left, right there. And then if we move that arm down about 10 degrees, uh, the, uh, it re-enters, I believe, there in the armpit area. Now, if somebody wants to argue with me and say, there's yet another wound. I wouldn't argue with that, but the fact that I can move this this arm down into an area that matches up with that wound in the armpit says to me it's probably one shot that goes through the arm, exits the arm, and then enters the body through the armpit. Let me show you exhibit uh, 249, uh, which purports to show the exit wound from the inside of that arm, perhaps a little more clearly than 
the previous yep. photograph. Um, Correct. So the exit <coughs> from the arm is on the right, and the re-entry into the chest is on the left. Now, uh, the wound that is seen on the, I guess you'd call it on the sort of the left side of the photograph, um, what, were you able to track any projectile associated with that particular wound? Um, no, no projectile through the arm. The uh, projectile is uh, present in the chest after it uh, re-enters into the chest. The reason that there's a discrepancy between the size difference between how it exits on the right, that smaller wound, and then the left has to do with what we term an intermediary target. And the intermediary target is the fact that it's left the arm and now it's re-entering the chest. So it carries with it some additional energy that's maybe a little bit dissipated, but the hole when it re-enters is bigger. And that immediately says, there's an intermediary target. The intermediary target is the arm. Now, this particular wound, um, did this enter the chest cavity? Yes. If I show you exhibit 250, um, <coughs> is that, tell us what that is. That's a uh, wound through the, uh, through the chest. The white areas that are kind of oblique, those are ribs. So this is between uh, ribs and the darker area is bleeding between the two ribs, but that's the wound as it enters the chest and then does uh, significant damage to the heart as well as to the lung on both sides, lungs on both sides. So would this particular projectile, uh, would this have been a, a fatal wound in this yes. case? Yes, there's significant bleeding internally into the chest and the damage that's been done to the heart as well as to the lungs. <clears throat> Let's move to the next um, gunshot wounds that you described that are uh, not the ones we just talked about. Gunshot wound C I've described as a graze wound that's uh, present on the left thigh. So the thigh is from the hip to the knee, and then the leg is from the knee to the ankle. And that would have been a graze wound? Yes. So it just grazes the skin. It does not enter the body, penetrate the body, other than just uh, rubs raw uh, portions of the skin and is uh, not recovered. Looking at exhibit 232, um, now these are uh, previously been admitted, is that graze or the tear in that fabric that was recovered in the uh, autopsy? that consistent with the area of the nature and nature of the wound that you observed? Yes, the, the photograph there of the of the jeans is from the back, so that is the left thigh. There's a blood stain there as well, which would be, bless you, which would be expected for uh, a graze wound, but uh, yes, right above the, uh, the ruler would be consistent with the graze wound. How about the next, and, and that would not have been a fatal wound. No, that, uh, as I say, that just uh, grazes the skin. It's like an abrasion. Rub, the skin is rubbed raw, but doesn't enter the body. The uh, next wound is gunshot wound D, and it is present on the uh, right buttock. And tell us a little bit about that wound, and would you say the right buttock approximately where on the body would that have been? It's in the, uh, the right butt cheek. It's uh, 35 inches above the ground. It's uh, 6 inches uh, lateral of the midline. It uh, enters and uh, does not enter the uh, does not enter the abdomen or the pelvis. It's uh, just recovered in uh, soft tissues uh, there. I'm going to show you Exhibit 231, which is another uh, photograph of genes. Um, is that uh, hole there and the, and the uh, Parent blood around that, is that consistent with that particular? Yes, very consistent with that. Again, you can see that's the back pocket on the right side of the jeans. Now, you previously indicated that one of the things that is done prior to an autopsy, if there's a, a suspicion of gunshot wounds, um, is to do x-rays. Yes. Um, and I want to mm -hmm. ask you, in this case, were x-rays done? Yes. <clears throat>
I'm going to show you what's previously been marked for purposes of identification as state's exhibits 218 through 228 and ask if you can identify what those are. These are x-rays that uh, we've taken at the medical examiner's office of the uh, decedent uh, Lisa Bunce. Um, are they fair and accurate copies of those x-rays that you uh, yes. took? This time I'd ask that States Exhibits 221 through 228 for identification be admitted as full exhibits. Any objection? Mm -hmm. They will be received. Um, this may be easier uh, if I could have the doctor stand down and kind of explain what it is that we're looking at. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> record with exhibit 218 and can we see that up there yep. okay can everybody see that so again uh, this is uh, she as she comes in uh, response as she comes in the office she's got bracelets on her arm here is a bullet in her chest that's uh, the bullet that comes from the uh, side from her uh, the right side into her uh, into the chest so this would be the one that comes under arm through right. the arm and then through yep. and this bullet was recovered yes Looking at exhibit 219, opposite side showing no bullet. And so the, the trajectory of the path of the bullet would not necessarily be seen in an x-ray, just no. a solid object, correct? Looking at exhibit 220, what are we looking at there? We're looking at the small fragments of uh, lead uh, here. This is a pelvis here, so this is on the inside of uh, the leg. This is on the left side, uh, small fragments of uh, lead. Right. Now, the small fragment of lead that looks kind of like a, a noodle in the middle, is that consistent with the left leg gene tear that we saw where you indicated there may be a graze wound? Could be. Looking at exhibit 221. A bullet here. This is a pelvis. These are the two arches of the pelvis, there is a bullet from the uh, bias, or from the thigh. Exhibit 222, uh, left side showing uh, no bullet. Exhibit 223, uh, bullet here in the, uh, behind the uh, pelvis, and again some radiopaque material down in the uh, thigh. Now, the bullet that was in the pelvis that you described up here, was that also removed and recovered? Yes. yes. Exhibit 224, uh, head x-ray showing earrings and uh, no projectile in the head. Exhibit 225, right hand showing no uh, projectile in the right hand. Now, this would have been the hand where the bullet went through the back and came out the front and no. caused that uh, soft tissue damage. That's correct. Exhibit 227. Now we're looking for the bullet. These are the top clips. They appear for us to mark while we take an x-ray. This is from the right side, and there's the bullet. And then finally, exhibit, well, not finally, but exhibit 227. These are uh, radiopaque materials from a uh, sponge that was put in at the time of uh, surgery. Uh, some type of radio. <coughs> Paint material that's uh, still uh, there, uh, whether it represents a towel or something, I'm not sure. Okay, but that was not any part of no. what you had to do. No. That's something from a previous, presumably, yes. And that is not related to gunshot wounds? No, it's not. 
And then finally, Exhibit 228, uh, right hand again, no uh, bullet uh, projectile skeletal damage there. All right, thank you for that, Doc. And uh, I just want to correct the record. I believe I had asked to introduce 221 through 228. Actually, it's 218 through 228. I, I misspoke upon representing these, removing these into evidence. I think that's what you offered. Is it? Okay. I, I, when I looked at it, I thought maybe the numbers, I had not included that. You have no objection, correct? No, sir. They've been received. Now, um, Dr. Nelson, uh, I'm going to show you Exhibit 241, <clears throat> and if you could, for the record, sort of describe what this is a photograph of in general. So, the uh, obviously a, a naked uh, photograph there, her hands are bagged for evidentiary purposes to collect any evidence that she may have in her hands. Uh, her family consented, next of kin consented for her to be a donor, so her long bones from her lower extremities were taken with the family's consent, and that's what those uh, incisions are that are present on her lower extremities, and that matches up with a previous photograph that uh, Mr. Johnson showed that shows that radio-opaque material in her thigh left over from the uh, uh, post-mortem a tissue procurement procedure there. And, and just so that we're clear for the jury, these, these kind of large stitched areas do not have anything to do with what you were looking for as far as the manner and cause of death? No, these are done after death and they're done with the consent of the next of kin uh, to allow something good to come out of something that's not so good. Um, doctor, there are numerous um, kind of dark areas, I, I look at them and call them bruise-like. Yep. Um, they're actually abrasions where the skin is rubbed raw. They're uh, consistent with what we term an intermediary target. So when bullets are shot like through a door or a wall or something like that, pieces of the door or wall can come out on the other side and strike the, uh, the victim and produce those type of uh, injuries. So that's what those are. So hypothetical question. If a bullet was fired through a sliding glass door as an individual was passing by, is this the type of injury or result that one would expect from that intermediary target firing along and, and kind of beginning to travel with some speed? Exactly. But not that the bullet has hit the victim. But fragments of glass, fragments of wood, fragments of whatever that intermediary target are has in fact struck the victim. Okay. Now, because these um, items or these, these abrasions uh, have reached the actual skin, uh, if someone was wearing a, a shirt, for example, would those have penetrated the material in the shirt or the pants and caused, uh, in order to cause this type of Okay. Yes, or, or they're of sufficient force with the material to produce that by striking the material and having the material produce those marks. I'm going to go back for a moment here and ask you about what's previously been introduced as State's Exhibit as far as the photographs as well as the actual um, objects themselves. 251. Um, can you tell us what that is? That's a, uh, a bullet. I can't read it. It says projectile from, looks like right subcutaneous. Yes. Uh, so that's a bullet that uh, has been taken out. It has my initials there next to it. And then there is a another one that says pro, uh, projectile and piece of clothing from right pelvis. So again, a, a fragment of a, a bullet as well as clothing taken out of the, uh, the wound from the right side of the pelvis. And so that's going to bring me back to um, Exhibit 231. The, this was recovered by you during the autopsy. Yes. And was the piece of clothing and the uh, bullet fragment, were they in some proximity with each other? Yes, they're intertwined. Intertwined. O oftentimes uh, a bullet, especially a uh, 
a partial copper jacketed bullet, not a complete jacket, but a partial jacket, will trap material that it's going through as it attempts to expand as it goes through the body, through the skin, through clothing. It will trap uh, pieces of uh, whatever. So in this particular case, it's clothing. Now, this particular clothing, um, if we go to exhibit 231 and we see the uh, hole in the back of the jeans, based on the proximity of this small tag of clothing intertwined with the uh, lead projectile, um, and of course indicating from the right pelvis, would this be consistent with this bullet tearing out a piece of the gene and kind of bringing it with it into the body cavity? Yes, it is. Now I want to talk a little bit more about Ms. Bunce's hand wound. Um, we've talked a little bit about um, that it did not actually strike any bones in the hand, but it did go through the, the palm, the soft tissues of the hand. So I want to start and show you a couple of uh, photographs, starting with exhibit, and I, maybe I'll start and give them to you here so that at least you can see them up close. I'm going to have you look at all of them and then I'm going to put them up on the board. So when you get it, once you're done looking at them, I'm going to... Okay. Um, so that way you get a little bit closer before I have you come down here. Looking at Exhibit 30, which is a marker between Marker 16 and Marker 15, and I believe this has previously been testified that it's related to Marker 16. This is, again, Exhibit 30. Is that apparent blood smear, is that consistent with, hypothetically, that palm injury if it was to be pressed downward into what in this case is a, a bit of carpeting? Yes. Looking at Exhibit 36, at Marker 19 and Marker... I'm sorry, Mr. Hernandez? Do you have an objection? Uh, there's a matter to dismiss. All Ladies and gentlemen, we're going to take a short uh, break, five, ten minutes at the most. All right, please. All right, we'll be seated. All right, we'll be five to ten minute break. Any problem with Dr. Nelson just keeping Hanging the seat?
we're back on the record. Mr. Murdoch is present with both his lawyers and his investigator. Mr. Levine is present. Oh, Mr. Johnson is present as well. Dr. Nelson is on the stand. We're ready if they're ready. Rise, please. Thank you. Um, looking at uh, Exhibit 36, where marker 19 and marker 20 are, um, hypothetically, the injury that was sustained to the right palm of Ms. Bunce's hand, the, the gunshot wound, um, are those placements, would those be consistent with a palm that had that type of damage pressing down on the ground? Yes. As opposed to, there are, you can see other, what appears to be blood drops. Yes. Okay. Looking at Exhibit 46, that shows marker 23 kind of going down the hallway, would that blood smear or streak be consistent with this injury to her palm? And I'm putting in 246 for, uh, as to illustrate that injury again. Would that be consistent with that individual kind of smearing the palm or trying to have the palm on the ground as they travel down uh, the hall. Objection, lack of foundation. Sustained. Let me ask you this way. The type of blood or the type of injury that this is demonstrating from a um, medical or, or physiological injury. My question hypothetically is, would this be consistent of this wound being dragged or, or moving along in this path. Same objection. It's a hypothetical question, Judge. Based on the approach. approach.
say reverse myself, I'll sustain the objection. Okay. Um, Dr. Nelson, looking at Exhibit 246 again, um, the nature of this injury, um, would this particular injury continue to bleed or to cast off blood, um, whatever position the hand was in? Yes, as long as the heart's still beating, it's going to bleed. Okay. And this is not a fatal wound? No, it is not. Eventually it will be if she bleeds out from that wound. Okay. But she has other wounds that are far more life-threatening than that. So my question would then be, um, would, uh, as far as Exhibit 46, um, would there be sufficient blood loss uh, to have blood on the floor, for example, if someone was to move with this injury? Yes. Okay. Now, in looking at Exhibit 55, uh, which shows markers 26 and 27, would there be blood loss from this injury uh, shown in Exhibit 246 to uh, leave blood on the floor, or in this case, in this exhibit, would there be a, would this be a sufficient enough injury to leave that type of blood uh, in, that, in a location like that? Yes, that uh, type of blood is uh, what we term low velocity. It's just dripping blood. So as long as the hand is not in contact with the floor, the blood is dripping off the hand, it will produce that type of a mark. And is that something that you're familiar with looking at crime scenes and things of that nature of what part of the part of training in forensic pathology? So forensic pathology does involve looking at that type of evidence as it relates to an injury. Absolutely. Um, Now, one of the things that you told us about earlier with regard to your, uh, with, with regard to an autopsy, um, is you talk about toxicology. Yes. Um, tell us a little bit about what toxicology means or what toxicology is. Toxicology is basically the, uh, the study of uh, drugs or poisons in the body. Now, when you do an autopsy, in addition to what you told us about, in addition to, in this case, the gunshots, the you know, tracking the bullet, removing the bullet, things of that nature. You also do a toxicology to determine if there was anything else in the person's system that may have contributed to their cause of death. Correct. Anytime we do an autopsy, we also do toxicology analysis on whatever specimens that we have available to us. In this case, it's blood, it's uh, ocular fluid, and it's also stomach contents. Okay. And in this case, was the toxicology done of Lisa Bunce? Yes. And what, if any, results were there uh, with regard to the toxicology uh, of Ms. Bunce? Well, it shows that she has uh, ethanol, spirit alcohol, uh, in her blood at a concentration of 0 0.072 grams per deciliter. In Florida, legal intoxication to operate a motor vehicle is 0 0.08 or higher, so she's slightly below that. Her vitreous humor, uh, however, is 0 0.108. So, that tells me that at one point her ocular fluid is higher than her blood. Ocular fluid lags behind the blood. So this is, a, uh, this is an example of absorption uh, taking place and that her vitreous fluid is higher because her blood alcohol at one point was at least as high beyond, as the alcohol. Beyond the scope of lack of foundation. A rule. Go ahead. So let me start again. So the ocular fluid at 0.1 is higher than her blood alcohol is. That says that her alcohol in her ocular fluid was at one point now. It is her blood alcohol is as high as her vitreous ocular fluid is now. So now she's starting to absorb alcohol. Her blood is now less than her ocular is. And at one point, it was 0.1. Okay. So given that ethanol concentration, is that something that would have been considered from a pathological standpoint as a medical examiner? Did that have anything to do with the cause of death in this case? No. What, in, at least in your experience, and this is part of what you do as well, is that correct? That is correct. 
Uh, in your uh, experience, is, is this uh, at the 0 0.07 or the ocular at 0.10, is that <coughs> unnecessarily, uh, where does that fall on the scale of, of, uh, of uh, alcohol intoxication? Well, certainly uh, the 0.72 is close to being a 0.08. Uh, not to say that she would not have any experienced uh, any uh, effects of alcohol, but she's not at that level that would result in an arrest if she was operating a motor vehicle. She's not at 0.08. But this is this is not um, a lethal dose of alcohol. Oh my gosh, no, absolutely not. Um, earlier, you talked about well, I asked you about the hand and, and the amount of blood and. The, you said that the low velocity might drip out of the hand uh, if it was not on contact with an item or something of that nature. I want to show you exhibit 97, and let me show it to you up close here first. Have you seen anything of that nature before during the course of your uh, work as the medical examiner oh, sure. over the last 20-something, excuse me, sure. years? Sure. You have seen that? Sure. All right. Is that part of what you have used uh, in your, well, training and or in what you do? Absolutely. It's part of forensic pathology. All right. And, and what are we looking at in that exhibit? We're looking at a bullet hole in a, a piece of a wall, and we're also looking at the blood spatter on either side of the hole, and the blood spatter, the fine particulate area, is consistent with what we term a cough. Okay. And, and is that, is it high, is it a oof? Higher velocity, yes. low velocity? It's high velocity. High velocity, very small particulate matter. Very consistent with a cough. Um, what I want to do now is, is ask you sort of the, I'll call them the lawyer questions that I have to ask you. Um, do you have a, an opinion with a reasonable degree of medical certainty as of the cause of death of Lisa Butts? Yes, multiple gunshot wounds. Do you have an opinion with a reasonable degree of medical certainty as to the manner of death? Yes, uh, homicide, death at the hand of another. Thank you, Doctor. I don't have any further questions. Thank you. Cross-exam. Yes. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. <coughs> You testified with regards to the toxicology of Lisa Bunce, right? Yes. Um, you're not a forensic toxicologist, are you? No. You've never testified as an expert in the field of forensic toxicology, right? Oh, contrary. Yes, I have. Uh, okay. The toxicologist is the one that prepares the analyses, but we interpret the analyses as forensic pathologists. Well, you utilize the toxicologist's information to come up with a cause of death. You don't actually, you're not actually a toxicologist, right? I'm, I said I'm not a toxicologist. I'm not the one that actually performs the analyses. Right. And we fact, rely on the laboratory analyses to render an opinion with regard to what those analyses are. Right. And in fact, the uh, blood tubes that were sent out from Lisa Bunce and the eye fluid, the vitreous humor fluid, was sent out to a Dr. Bruce Goldberg, Goldberg correct? Correct. He was the toxicologist at the University of Florida that we use for our toxicology analysis. And Dr. Goldberger, who is a toxicologist, then tested those fluids and determined what, if any, alcohol or other substances were in those fluids and then reported back to you his findings, correct? Yes. And I... And in your findings, do you, do you know or do you recall where the blood was taken from the body? The blood is taken from a femoral on either left, and, left or right, but a femoral vein, and it's from the Oregon Procurement Agency. Okay, the femoral vein, which would be in the leg? In the groin, yes. All right. And from a procurement agency? From yes. Life? LifeLink. LifeLink? Yes. So LifeLink would have taken these vials of blood from the... Vein in the leg? Yes. Right. Standard procedure. So when you receive the body to <clears throat> conduct a forensic pathology exam, pathological autopsy. autopsy exam of the body, the body had already been um, 
long bones had been donated by the family. Right, so the body did not come to you from the crime scene itself, right? Well, it came to us from the crime scene and then went from our office to LifeLink after LifeLink had contacted the family and the family had given consent for the uh, donation. Okay, so I just want to be clear. So the body is taken from one of one, someone that works for your, your agency, your office, is transported to the medical examiner's office, right? Yes. And then the body, you don't, you're not doing an autopsy at that point? That's correct. You, the body then goes to LifeLink? That's correct. Where is LifeLink located? LifeLink is located in Tampa. And where's your office located? Winter Haven. All right, so it goes from Payne City to Winter Haven to Tampa, right? Yep. And then back to Winter Haven. Correct. Happens every day. So when you receive the body, Bless you. Bless you. the body had already been various sutures, cuts, and what have you, and organs had been... No, no removed. organs. No, no organs. organs, just the bones, the just, long bones? Just the long bones, just what you saw in that photograph that Mr. Johnson uh, put up there, which are the incisions that are made on the lower extremities. And as again, the family consented for long bones to be donated for uh, uh, post-mortem uh, use in, uh, in living people. Prior to the body being sent to LifeLink, do you give any instructions to them as to what not to do to the body in well, order to preserve yeah, there, I mean, there, it's evidence, right? Yeah, there's certainly, uh, that's why the hands are bagged, the hands were still bagged there, uh, and that, so they know that they don't touch wounds. So they're not in the area that are associated uh, with wounds. Uh, by the time the body comes to us, law enforcement crime scene has already done uh, what they need to do. Uh, so that uh, then once, as I said before, the family makes the decision to donate and the donation takes place. Well, you would agree with me some of those sutures that are on the legs of that body were near, very, very near to various wounds that were pointed out by the prosecutor. No, I wouldn't no? I, I wouldn't agree with you on that. But what uh, Mr. Bondi talked about were the uh, wounds that are intermediary targets, the small abrasions and that, but they're not uh, near the, uh, the gunshot wounds. Did you recover or take out any glass that was on the body? I don't recall. In the body? I don't recall, no. Would you have notated that in your autopsy report, if your we findings? Saw it. Yes, if we saw it, yes. So gunshot wound A, you indicated in your report that was a distant range. And my question for you is, what in your mind is a distant range? Well, what in my mind is the same as every other forensic pathologist's mind and that has to do with the distance of muzzle to target. So the muzzle target distance in order to be a distant wound is beyond two feet. Closer than two feet, the muzzle target distance, there are materials that come out of the muzzle of the gun that make their way onto the target, in this case, skin, such as powder, soot, stipple, which is burned and unburned gun powder. There's none of that present on the body. So because of that, we call it a distant wound indicating it's beyond two feet. So it's beyond two feet, could be 10 feet, sure. right? Could sure. be 15 feet? Absolutely, could be across the uh, across the room, across the street, yep. That's right. why it's called a distant wound. I believe all of them are termed, uh, with the exception of D, which is an indeterminate range, same thing as a distant wound. There's nothing on the body that says to me that I can give you an estimate of range of fire with various muzzle target distance. Beyond that, there's no evidence of close range firing, close muzzle target distance, so we call it a distant wound or an indeterminate range. And as you sit here, you cannot tell us which one of those wounds were inflicted first? No. Doctor, the, the wound that penetrated the chest cavity, um, 
you described as going through the outside of the left arm, the intermediate target, and then into the chest. How long would one expect to live with that degree of wound? Not very long. It uh, produces uh, damage. Uh, that is, wound uh, B produces damage uh, uh, to the pulmonary artery, the left atria, and oracle of the heart. So those are pumping change chambers of the heart, as well as within both the left and right lung. So, you know, uh, just maybe a minute or two, a couple of minutes. Okay. Would one be expected to be able to move around freely uh, in that circumstance with that mortal wound? Well, it's not going to be immediately life-threatening, like snap your fingers, like a, a wound to the spinal cord would be, something like that. So, yes, as long as there's, there's still the ability to pump blood, oxygenate your brain, and you can still move around as a result of that. But I don't think it's going to be a long period of time. Um, the other wounds, however, were not <laughs> fatal wounds, at, at least within that short period of that, time. That's correct. And that wound... Uh, the fatal wound came from the left side, is that correct? Yes. All right. So uh, if Ms. Bunce was in the closet with her left side facing the closet door, that would be consistent with that? Yes, it would. As opposed to leaving a room from the right side where the other injuries occurred, right arm, right hip? Yes. Okay. Now, um, as far as the, uh, the harvesting of the... Uh, the lower long bones. Um, it, you know, I heard the question, well, it goes from, the body goes from Haines City to your office to Tampa, etc. Tell us a little bit about the importance of harvesting an organ or a bone and the time in which it is actually feasible. Well, it's certainly feasible within the first 24 hours of death. It's, uh, it's certainly... Uh, sorry. I was overruling the objection, and I coughed and wasn't sure. <laughs> it, it certainly happens within the first uh, 24 hours after death, and it's uh, something that I said earlier, we try to make a, a good situation out of a bad situation. So we allow for the Organ Procurement Agency, in this case it's federally designated, it's LifeLink of Florida, they operate out of 14 counties in West Central Florida, they're designated by the Department of Health, and human services to do this, to obtain organs and tissues for transplantation purposes. There is a dearth of organs and tissues for transplantation. People die on the waiting list to have transplants. So we are very proactive with LifeLink in allowing them to uh, make a, an approach to the next of kin to talk to the families about someone who has died. Will they be receptive to their loved one being a donor. And, and I guess the bottom line to my question and to this line of questioning is, did the fact that Lisa Bunce's body traveled to Tampa to undergo this lifelink procedure, <clears throat> did that have any effect whatsoever on either, or any aspect of the autopsy? That you None whatsoever. And you said this is something that happens all the time. Happens all the time. Happens every day of the week. Thank you, Doctor. Dr. Nelson released. Yes. Ms. Toomey. Yes, sir. Thank you. Thanks, sir. <clears throat> Next witness. Shalom Tarak. Do you solemnly swear or affirm that the testimony you give in this case will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Thank you. Shalyn Tork, that's spelled S-H-A-L-L-Y-N, last name T-O-R-O-K. Thank you. And where are you currently employed? I'm currently employed with the Hillsborough County Sheriff's Office. 
And in what capacity are you employed? I am a firearms analyst in the forensic laboratory. Now, how long have you worked for Hillsborough County in that capacity? For approximately a year and a half. Prior to that, uh, where did you work? I worked for the state lab, the Florida Department of Law Enforcement. Um, I did that for 18 and a half years in the same capacity. So I was a firearms examiner for them as well. Now, could you tell us a little bit about what a firearms examiner is? My primary duty is to determine whether or whether or not fired ammunition components came from a particular firearm. Now you say fired ammunition components. Could you tell us a little bit about what that means? Sure. Um, the unit of ammunition, or round is what we're calling it, um, that has two parts that will leave marks or have marks left on them from the firearm. So it's generated by four parts. There's the cartridge case, and that is kind of what we call the Tupperware that holds the other parts. There's the primer on the back, which is the ignition source. There's going to be gunpowder in the middle, and this is when the primer is struck. The gunpowder will then get ignited and cause an explosion, and then that then will propel the bullet out to its target. Okay. So you've described to us that the bullet, if you will, a lot of people just call it a bullet for common uh, terms, but that's made up of different components that you've just described for us. Correct. So there's the part that comes out and goes flying through the air, and what do you call that? So that's called a bullet or a projectile. All right. Then there's the, the Tupperware that you call it, which is uh, where all that stuff is kind of stuck into. What is that professionally called? A cartridge case. And you said there's something inside of that? There's gunpowder inside of that. And then there's, uh, what was the thing that ignites the gunpowder? It's a little primer, a little disc on the back of the cartridge case. Okay. So there's a primer, a cartridge case, gunpowder, and then finally the bullet. Correct. Now, what about, well, I'll get into that in a second. So tell us a little bit about, you know, your background in doing this. Uh, what type of training and background do you have uh, to perform this job? I have a bachelor's degree in forensic science from the University of Central Florida. I also have a master's degree in forensic science from the University of Florida. While I was with the Florida Department of Law Enforcement, I completed their 18-month-long structured training program. The, this is about firearms identification. So this dealt with subject matter such as standard laboratory practices and techniques, microscopy, photomicroscopy, firearm and ammunition identification and recognition, serial number restoration, and muzzle to target distance determination. During that training, I also had to tour many of the major firearm manufacturers in order to learn about all the manufacturing processes that go into making the firearms, which is what makes my job possible. Okay. So uh, you have this educational background and training. Um, let me ask you this, as far as your experience, um, how often over the last, well, 18 and a half years with FDLE and now a year and a half with Hillsborough County, uh, how many times have you performed uh, this type of analysis regarding a firearm or ammunition? In the thousands. And have you ever had an opportunity to testify and render an opinion with regard to your findings? Yes, I have. Do you have any idea how often that has happened? Approximately 82 was my last count. 82? Yes. Okay. Um, in addition to what you've described as training in the past, is there any sort of program or continuing education that you have to go through in order to maintain uh, proficiency in your particular area of expertise? Uh, yes, there is. Could you tell, tell us a little bit about that? Um, so we have some external proficiency tests that are given to us by an outside department. It's called the Collaborative Testing Services. And what they do is they will generate a test. Um, it'll have known samples. They'll either be all cartridge cases or all bullets. Um, I do not know the answer. I'm given the test, and then I have to take the test, complete it, and then send it back to the company, and then they'll determine whether or not I made the correct response. And have you consistently done these, uh, I guess, quality control training tests throughout your uh, career? Yes, I have. All right. Uh, and are you current and up to date with the, I guess, the latest testing and proficiency that's required uh, by your agency? Yes, I am. All right. So, what I want to ask you about now is is to try to explain to us. Um, when you talk about comparisons and, and these different things, what is it, and I, I suppose it depends on the case, but what is it that you're able to compare 
uh, to determine if a particular projectile or casing was fired by a particular firearm. What, what are the tools, I and mean, how do you figure that out? Can you explain that to us? So the basic principle behind my science is that a harder object is gonna mark a softer object. So the harder object we have here will be the firearm, and that's gonna mark those softer objects, that bullet that has like a copper jacket, or the cartridge case which has a brass casing. Uh, copper and brass are both very soft in comparison to say like a steel barrel inside a bullet. So that is what allows me to do my job. When I'm looking at things, the first part that I will look at is I'm looking at something called class characteristics. And so if I have a firearm and I have components in front of me, I'm then going to be looking at these class characteristics. These are characteristics that are specific to a group of firearms and they're determined prior to the manufacturing process, so in the blueprint phase. So if you can think that I have three red Ford Mustangs, the fact that they're made by Ford, the fact that they're Mustangs, and the fact that they're red, all of these are class characteristics. There's several cars out there that have these similar characteristics. So once I determine that my class characteristics are similar, I will then move down to that individual level, that microscopic <coughs> unique marks. And these happen during the manufacturing process of the firearm, as well as during just regular use and abuse of that firearm. So if we go back to those three red Ford Mustangs, now I have one red Ford Mustang that let's say has a crack in the windshield and a ding in the front corner panel. Well, now that red Mustang is now unique and different from all other red Ford Mustangs. So that is what I'm allowing myself to look at when I'm using my comparison microscope. So I'm looking at these class characteristics and these individual characteristics that were left by a firearm. Okay, uh, and thank you for that class characteristics versus the unique or specific characteristics of a particular Red Ford Mustang. Now, you talked about a ding in the front and a crack in the windshield. What types of things are you looking at to make a particular firearm beyond the class characteristic? What types of uh, things are there in the firearm, either in its manufacture or in its function, that create that crack in the windshield or that ding on the bumper? So when the firearm is manufactured, that's where these first will come up. So you're going to have these really hard steel pieces cutting and turning and making the firearm. And every time they're turning and cutting, they're going to have metal chips. And each one of those metal chips will now start to also chip away at each different part. So the more it's manufactured and the more it's used, the more these parts get individualized, as we like to say. So what I'm looking at is once I see that my class characteristics are the same, I'm then going to start looking at the individual characteristics. We like to say that it's similar to like a fingerprint or like a signature. So every gun has a unique signature or has a unique fingerprint. So depending on what I'm looking at, so if you want to say let's talk about projectiles, I'll be looking for a series of striations, which are just like a series of lines or scratches. You can think of like a UPC barcode. The UPC barcode for Cheerios is not the same as Frosted Flakes. They have different lengths and widths. They have different peaks and valleys. It's the same thing. So I'm looking at these striations. When we transfer back to, let's say, the cartridge case, I'll be looking at things such as what's left a mark on that primer itself, and that's from the actual firing pin hitting that primer to detonate that cartridge, the primer hitting back into the firearm, because remember, there's a huge explosion. So the cartridge case is expanding and shooting back against the back of the firearm, and then the bullet is going in the opposite direction out. So the marks for the bullet are coming from that barrel as it's spiraling down that barrel and getting propelled out that barrel. And then the marks in the cartridge case are coming from the inside of that firearm. So again, it's expanding and it's hitting and it's picking up all those marks, as well as there's also, depending on the gun, you can also have like a little hook that'll pull it and then pull the casing out, which you've seen in movies where you'll see the brass casings when they get ejected out. So there's parts in there that will also pull that cartridge case out and eject it as well, and those can also leave marks. Now, these marks that you're talking about, are these visible by, with the naked eye? Some are visible, but most I have to look at with the microscope. Now, you talked about this manufacturing process. So in my mind, I'm, I'm picturing a you know, a conveyor belt with a bunch of different gun barrels or a bunch of different gun uh, frames rolling on down the Smith & Wesson line, and they're all being drilled out by, you know, different, uh, being drilled out as they go. Are you telling us that if I have 
gun serial number one and gun serial number two or three consecutively in there, that each one of those guns, Smith & Wesson as a class characteristic, would have different microscopic nicks in them that would make them unique. Yes, and uh, I know this because during my training, we've um, purchased consecutively manufactured barrels. So we've gotten 12 barrels that are right off the line. They've been cut in size, and then we test fired all 12 of the barrels, and then we were able to see whether or not you could determine that barrel number 12 and barrel number one were different, as well as if you could ID the bullets back to each barrel. And I was able to ID the bullets back to each barrel. So even if they are made one right after another, because you have such hard metal and all these pieces coming together and all these metal chips, they're individual right off the floor, right off the factory floor. So let's, and, and I'll break it into two different parts. Uh, there's the barrel of the gun, and then there's the, the mechanism of the gun, the, the firing mechanism. When it comes to the barrel of the gun, what are some class characteristics and how do you determine individual characteristics when it comes to the barrel of the gun, which I assume would involve the bullet, the, the thing that flies out and, and hits something. What do you look at there? The first class characteristic is going to be the caliber, and that's just the size of the bullet. So some common calibers would be like 9mm Luger, 40 Smith & Wesson, 45 Auto. And basically, that's just going to be the diameter of the bullet itself. So you can think of like a penny versus a nickel versus a quarter. They have different diameters. So the 9 would be smaller, then your 40, and then your 45. Um, so once I determine what the caliber is and make sure that the bullets that I have could actually have been fired or actually fit inside that gun, I then will look down the barrel itself to see what kind of rifling it has. And rifling are just spiral grooves that are cut or impressed into the barrel and it gives what they like to call gyroscopic stability, which is just a big word to say that I put a spin on something and it'll go farther and faster and more accurate. Kind of like if you throw a football. If you put a spin on it, it'll go farther, faster, and more accurate. So each type of manufacturer will have a certain number of rifling that they will put into that barrel. So some will have five landing grooves cut and spin to the right, and some will have six landing grooves and spin to the left. So those are some of the class characteristics that I look at. You can also measure those grooves with the microscope to see the width of those. So some might have a six right, and then another company has a six right, but then the width of those lands and grooves will be different. So those are the class characteristics that I'm looking at. Once I determine that those class characteristics are the same, by using my comparison microscope, which is basically just two microscopes that are linked by one optical bridge so I can see two different specimens together, I then start looking for that signature, that, or that fingerprint of the uh, bullet itself to see if that will match what I have in my case. So I'm looking for that UPC barcode, those striations. And when you talk about that, the, the striations of that UPS, of the UPS UPC, uh, uh, signature, the, the, the specific class characteristics. What are the types of things that you're going to see different between the same manufacturer with the same lands and the number of lands and grooves in the same measurement? What are you going to see that's going to separate that from a class characteristic into a unique specific characteristic of that particular firearm? What is it you're looking at? So if you're looking at, let's say, the <coughs> land impression, the land impression um, will have two shoulders. And inside that shoulder, you would actually then see your UPC barcode. And what that looks like to try and give, I don't know if you can remember back in the day, we used to have globes, and you'd have the smooth globe, or if you got the really big <coughs> globe, and it had like the topography, we could have the mountains were all poking out on the globe. So that's what we're looking for. We're looking at a UPC barcode, but it's more in a 3D dimension. So we're looking at the different peaks the ridges, the valleys, how far those lines or striations are spaced from each other. So once I put it up to my microscope and I see that I have all, let's just say, six right bullets. So they're all, they all have six lands and grooves and they're all spinning to the right. And then I put them up together and I say, oh, the limps and gimps are also the same width. So these two shoulders match up with these two shoulders. Now there's where my class characteristics pretty much stop. I then start to look at that microscopic barcode and start to look and see how that pattern is going, like how far they're spaced apart, the height, the width, the depth. So you're looking at three-dimensional objects, and it's a three-dimensional pattern is what I'm trying to represent. 
And with regard, and I'll ask you about this in a second when I get to the frame and the, the uh, firing mechanisms, but with regard to the barrel and the, the lands and the grooves and this type of science, is this something that's been around for a while? Yes. Okay. Do you have any idea how long? I've obviously been long as, <laughs> as long as you've been doing it. Yes. Uh, um, but does it go back historically? Yes, it's over 100 years old. Okay. And are you aware of any two firearms in the course of your training, your experience, ever being exactly the same? No, I am not. Are you aware of anybody who is aware that two guns were identical? No, I am not. Now let's talk a little bit, we, we've talked about the barrel now and these lands and grooves, both the class characteristics and the individual characteristics, those barcode differences in there, as they kind of relate to a bullet, because those impressions would arguably be impressed onto that soft metal or jacketing of a bullet. Let's talk about the action or the firing mechanism of a firearm. In this case, we're going to talk about a Glock, but in general, in a semi-automatic weapon, uh, or I guess even a revolver when it comes to the firing pin. Tell us what you have with class characteristics and or individual characteristics when it comes to that part of the gun. Um, first, I'll explain how it works so that way you can understand where some of the marks on the cartridge case are occurring since it is happening inside the firearm. So when you have a firearm, the first thing you're going to do is to, in the grip, typically they'll insert a magazine. We're talking about a semi-automatic, specifically a Glock, let's say. That's going to house our ammunition or our cartridges. So you'll put that into the base of the gun, and then you will have to manually pull that slide back. Now what that's doing is it's going to pull back and it's going to, in essence, cock the firearm, okay? Then when I release that slide, it's going to pick up a cartridge out of that magazine and it's going to load it into the barrel. And as the slide comes completely forward to meet with the frame, it's going to lock. At this point, it is locked and ready to go. That's why they say locked and loaded is some of the terminology that we use. So at this point, that means it's ready to fire. So the next step is I will pull the trigger and when I pull the trigger, it'll either release the hammer or release the striker, depending on which type of firearm. And then that striker or firing pin will then hit that primer, and then it'll cause the explosion, and then the bullet will go down the barrel. And as that's happening, once the gas pressure has decreased, then the slide will be pushed rearward from all of that gases. And as it's pushed rearward, it's going to pull or extract that cartridge case from the chamber, and then it will eject it out of the gun. At this point, the slide has gone back, it has recocked, and then on the forward motion, it'll pick up another cartridge and be ready to go. Some of the class characteristics that I look for on that cartridge case would be from that firing pin itself when it hits that primer, firing pins will have different shapes. Some can be rectangular, some can be circular, um, some can be oval, and then within that firing pin itself, there'll be specific marks. Some can have shapes, we can go back to some even having those striations, so those are like the individual and class characteristics within that. The other portion that you would look at is that primer, when that firing pin is hitting it and it's causing that explosion, that cartridge case itself is gonna slam back into the breech phase. And as it slams back into that internal portion of that slide, it's picking up marks from that slide. And these are called breech face marks. These again have different class characteristics. We can do parallel, we can do shape, we can do crosshatch. So there's many different types of shapes that you can see or different styles. And those class characteristics, again, would belong to a unique group of set of guns, but they're not actually individual, and so I look at them in the microscope. So if I could, you now we, we do have a, a firearm that I'm gonna ask you about, and it's been secured. Um, and the bailiff has talked about it, and I'm gonna put in front of you for the record what's been uh, introduced into evidence as item or exhibit number 260 and I'm going to point it even though it's not uh, even though it's inert and it's all got a lock on it and if you could kind of show you now we, we, we can't slide the slide back because it's safe but some of the things that you've just described and I'm also going to put in front of you exhibit 261 kind of <coughs> demonstratively here's the clip that would go into it so you just described the function of a firearm like that could you kind of point to what you were talking about? You did a good job moving your hands and stuff, but as far as how that works, maybe we could kind of visually see what you're talking about. 
So this right here is our magazine, and this is where you will put your cartridges. There's a spring-actuated magazine follower, and you just load the cartridges in here. Think of it kind of like a Pez dispenser, so when they're getting unloaded, it's just pushing them out from that magazine. The magazine then is going to get inserted into this portion here, this grip portion here, and then now the firearm is, has ammunition, so now you can load it. You will then pull this slide back, so when you pull this rearward, it will then cock the firearm, and then upon its forward motion, it's going to actually strip a cartridge out of the top of this magazine, and then it will feed it here into this chamber, which is kind of that recessed spot you can see here. And the chamber is actually directly connected with the barrel. Now it, the slide has moved completely forward, touching that chamber, so now it is locked and it's ready to go. The next step would be to pull the trigger, which is located behind the trigger lock right here. So I would pull the trigger, that then is going to release the firing mechanism, allowing that firing pin to come and strike that cartridge. And then the little explosion occurs, and then the bullet would travel out of the barrel. And then the cartridge case, which is in the chamber, will begin to get extracted and ejected by this rearward motion. So you pull it back, you release it, you fire it, the slide then comes back. A little hook will then pull that cartridge case out. And then there's another little stick next to it called the ejector, and he kicks it out. So then that cartridge case flies out, and then the gun, as the slide is pulled back, it's recocking forward motion again, picking up another cartridge from that magazine, and now it's ready to go. All right, and I'm going to put Exhibit 4 up on the screen, which is the same firearm. What we see in front of you is the weapon as the slide is forward, as if perhaps there was a round in the chamber ready to fire. You talked about the slide either being pulled back to cock or automatically cocking back and forth based on the explosion and, uh, of the bullet going out and the uh, uh, cartridge being ejected. Is this the position, essentially, of what you've described here when it's not in that position? Yes. Okay. Is this also a position, uh, when else does this position occur where the uh, slide remains locked back in this particular firearm? So there's two ways you can manually do it. You can pull the slide back and you can see there's kind of like a shiny square right in the middle below the slide. That's kind of seen out. That's okay. called a, a slide. Perfect. Yes, that's called a slide lock stop. So you'll pull it back and there's a recess in the slide and you push up and then that will hold the slide open. The other way that this works is once you have used all of your ammunition. So say you have seven rounds in your magazine and you fired it seven times. After you fired it seven times and the magazine is empty, there's a little lip on this top of this magazine follower here that once it's empty, this little lip will actuate and internally it takes that square slide stop and pushes it up and locks it open. So it's a sign for the shooter that you are now out of ammunition. So you'll put your ammo in here, you fire the gun, and then once you've run out of ammunition and your magazine is empty, the gun will automatically lock back and stay in that position until you close it or put a new magazine in. Okay. So with, with the clip, and can you tell from this photograph, which is Exhibit 4, can you tell if the clip is in by looking at the photograph? Can you tell that the magazine, I should say, call it a clip, the magazine is in this weapon? It is. Okay. <laughs> and the fact that this slide is locked back, is that consistent with your explanation that there's no more ammunition in there, unless someone has pulled it back and manually locked it. Correct, yes. Okay. And assuming hypothetically that there was actually no ammunition in there, the way that would normally happen is the gun would run out of ammunition and lock itself back. Correct. Okay. Now, you told us about uh, the individual uh, and the class characteristics of the barrel and the marks that it may make on a bullet. And you told us about the workings, the firing mechanism, and the class characteristics and the individual characteristics as far as that section of the gun. When, it, when we talk about the, the barrel and the rifling, normally what component are you going to compare? What part of that bullet or that cartridge casing uh, or that, that, I call it a bullet, but the, 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 the thing you stick in the gun, what part of that are you going to be looking at when it comes to the projectile? 
So the projectile itself, I'm going to be looking at the outer portion of that projectile, so the outer portion of that bullet. And is what you're looking for is a possible correspondence with the barrel end? Correct. Now when it comes to the casing, or the part that holds the primer and holds the powder, what part of the gun are you going to be looking at for any potential comparisons in that regard? So with the cartridge case, I'm going to be looking at the firing pin impression, so when it actually pierced the primer and what shape that is, plus what uh, patterns inside that, as well as this front portion of the slide we call the breech face. So remember that primer is going to hit back on that with all that pressure, so I'm looking at the marks that the breech face allow on it as well as um, the marks that are along the outside where it actually has expanded against that chamber. Okay. So if I was to take a, a cartridge casing or a, or a bullet, and would you be able to, if I had an entire bullet, would you be able to compare the projectile to the barrel and the casing to the firing pin in that area? Yes. So you'd actually have two different things to look at from the same firearm? Correct. Okay. Now. What I want to ask you about is, in this case, what were you provided to look at um, and try to compare? So I had um, this, this submitted firearm. I also had five cartridge cases, fired cartridge cases, and then two projectiles. All right, so what I'm going to do now is I'm going to show you Um, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to start in this case with the bullet part. So what I'll call the, the bullet from this part out the barrel lands in grooves, the things that you described that the bullet will pick up, both the class characteristics and the unique characteristics. So in front of you, and I didn't memorize the numbers, I apologize, I have in front of you what's been introduced into evidence as States Exhibit 260, the magazine, which is Exhibit 261. And then I also have projectiles, um, 279, 278, and 280. So were you provided, and, and we'll go, we'll get to the other stuff in a minute, but were you provided those items for comparison? Uh, these two have the unique FDLA case number, the exhibit number, and the, uh, <coughs> in my handwriting, located here on both of these. This item... Um, does not have any of my markings on that. Okay, so that one was one that you were not provided with? Yes, a State Exhibit 280. Okay, and that is, that is a piece of cloth yes. that was associated with a bullet, but you can't test a piece of cloth. Correct. Okay, I'm going to put that one to the side. So let's talk about the other two. First of all, um, how is it that you can test um, to determine whether or not one of those two projectiles? Well, well first of all, let me back up. Do you need a projectile that has a certain amount of substance to it in order to compare? In other words, is there is if it's too damaged? Uh, you know, if I if I took your red Mustang with the with the crack in the windshield and I brought it to the auto crusher <coughs> and he smashed into a million pieces, and you really don't know what kind of car it is anymore. You can't use that one. Correct. Do bullets come to you in that particular form, metaphorically? Yes, they can. Okay. Um, and if you actually, so, so I guess what I'm asking you is what kind of, or what degree of um, completeness do you need in order to test whether or not a bullet has been fired through a particular gun barrel? Um, depending on the type of the bullet, um, I'm going to need the outermost portion of that bullet. And that's going to be what actually is touching that barrel inside. So, um, for example, in this case, I have um, two projectiles. Um, 
One of them I know is a jacketed hollow point, which just means that it has a copper jacket that has a lead center. So think about an M&M, a hard outer candy shell is our copper jacket, and then the lead center would be our chocolate. Well, that lead center is not gonna touch anywhere in that barrel because it has its copper jacket on. So all of the markings that I want to look at and that I need for my analysis would be on the jacket. If I were to, let's say, just get a lead core, just that center part, then I wouldn't have any information on there because again, it did not touch any part of that barrel. So that would be something that would be limiting. So sometimes you are, provi are you providing <coughs> with, um, bullets that are useful for analysis? And are there times when you are provided bullets that don't have any value as far as comparison? Yes. All right. And in this case, is that kind of what we have? Yes, it is. Okay. So explain to us the difference uh, between what you were provided in these two bullets and what the type of analysis you could or could not do with each one of them. With both of the bullets, I still have to figure out, regardless what type, whether it's damaged or it's intact, I still have to fill out a comprehensive worksheet. And this is just going to be based on physical characteristics. So I'm going to be looking to see, you know, what type of bullet is it? Is it a jacket at hollow point? Does it have a copper jacket or a nickel jacket? Um, does it have a steel core or a lead core? And I'm just doing basic observations. I'll then also weigh the bullet itself because that'll help determine what caliber it could be. And I also take measures of the measurements of the diameter because again, if we go back to that nickel penny quarter, they all have specific diameters. And then I'm also going to look at the number of lands and grooves and then measure those as well. So when I get into specimens such as this, I then will fill out that comprehensive worksheet. Um, number 14 for me, which is States Exhibit 279, when I was filling out that worksheet, um, I determined that it was a jacketed hollow point bullet, so, and it had both the jacket and the core intact. When I examined number 15 for me, but number 278 states exhibit, it was just a lead core. So again, it was just the center of that bullet and it did not have the jacket on it. Okay. So when it doesn't have the jacket on it, the exhibit that you just said it was your item uh, 15, um, that was not use, useful for comparison based on not having that outer candy coating on it. The, Correct. The M&M &M coating. Yes, it did not have any marks that I could use in order to compare to the firearm. Now, the other bullet, um, and both of these Dr. Nelson just talked about in autopsy, this one bullet, uh, Exhibit 278 from the pelvis, that was not useful. Correct. But the Exhibit 279 from the pass through the chest, that was one that was useful. Correct. So tell us what you did and what you determined with regard to that projectile, that bullet. So after I did my comparison, um, just of looking at the worksheet itself and then looking at the, the bullet and I wrote down all of the notes, I then take any of the physical characteristics and I then will see if they match the submitted firearm. So when I work up this firearm and I produce those test fires from the firearm, I'm going to actually have bullets and cartridge cases from this gun itself. So I'll receive this gun, I do a comprehensive worksheet, then I take it into my water tank and I'll shoot it typically four times. And right. I'll get four bullets and four cartridge cases. Okay, well then that's exactly what I want to ask you about. So you, in order to do this, you actually shoot something from this same firearm yourself? Correct. Now in so doing, does that help you A, determine whether it actually functions? Yes. Because a gun that doesn't shoot probably wasn't used. Um, so you actually do test fires. And yes, I do. And that's to recover bullets and or casings that you can microscopically compare to what was submitted to you. Correct. All right. I'm going to show you in just a minute what's previously been marked for purposes of identification as States Exhibit 277. You this. I'm going to ask you to take a look at that and tell me if you can identify what they are. So 
So again, it has the unique FDLE case number, the exhibit number, and um, my initials and my handwriting with the date on all of the packaging and the items themselves. And these are the four test fires that I <coughs> collected and generated when I was test firing this firearm. All right, so let me ask you a little bit about test firing. Now, the bullets that you have that were sent to you for comparison from the morgue were taken out of somebody's body. And is there some damage to the bullets just from that act of going through some sort of a target? Sometimes there'll be damage, sometimes not. It just depends. In this particular case, it did have some damage. Okay. Now, your test fires, um, assuming you don't run around and shoot at things that will damage a bullet, how, what's the methodology behind a test fire where you can <coughs> um, keep the uh, casing and keep the bullet um, and use it to compare without damaging it? Um, once I have looked at the uh, firearm itself, I do another comprehensive worksheet, and that's just make, model, serial number, information like that, the safeties on it, um, and whether or not I can get it to function without live ammo. Once I determine that it's safe and that it can function properly, I will then take it into the range, and we have a water recovery tank, which is basically just a huge steel tank that has a porthole and you will put the firearm in there and then you will fire the gun. Um, so I typically fire four times, which is what I did in this case. Um, the bullets themselves will go into the water tank and that water will rapidly slow those bullets down. So that way they're not hitting the side of the tank, they're not hitting each other, and then that keeps them in a pristine form. Um, the cartridge cases itself, because we're dealing with a semi-automatic handgun, those are gonna be ejected out of that firearm. And um, the tank that I use has a mesh net outside of the porthole. So as I'm firing and the cartridge cases are leaving the firearm, they land into that net. So I'm able to collect the four cartridge cases and the <coughs> four bullets that I actually made with that firearm. And is Exhibit 277, is that, uh, are all those in substantially the same condition as when you recovered them from the water tank and the word the mesh net that recovers the cartridge casings? Yes, they are. This time I'd ask that States Exhibit 277 for identification be admitted as a full exhibit. Any objection? No objection. It will be received. Now, when you make your comparison to the, uh, from the fire, uh, test fire bullets in this case, and I'm, I'm sticking with the bullets right now, we'll get to the casings in a minute. Um, were you able to look at the two of them simultaneously? That is the one that was submitted uh, from the uh, Law enforcement to the <coughs> one that you test fired, and what were you able to determine, if anything? Can I refer to my notes? Absolutely. Okay. Um, so both the test fire and the state's exhibit 279 bullet, um, both of them were six right, which means they had six landing grooves cut into that barrel with a right hand twist. Um, they um, also were both of the correct caliber, so they were a 38 caliber family, which means they could be 9 millimeters, 38s, 357s, so those measurements were correct. Um, and then once I determined that those class characteristics were similar, meaning that this fire, this fire bullet could fit and work inside that firearm, and it had the six lands and grooves with the right twist, I then moved down to the microscopic level to look at that individual characteristics or the signature that was left on my test fires versus the signature that is on the submitted bullet. And what were your conclusions? I determined that this bullet was fired from this gun. Okay. And to what degree of certainty do you normally use in order to make that determination? How, how, what are you comparing microscopically? So what I'm looking for is the actual repeatable pattern, as I keep saying. Um, but you have to have um, certain quality and quantity within that mark. So if you can kind of think of like if, remember back in the day, we used to have the stamps. And so you would do an ink stamp, and then you would stamp and stamp and stamp. And as you got farther and further down the line of the stamp, you could lose some of that clarity, some of that quality. And you might not get the whole entire picture. So not only are you looking at the quantity of what's left in that stamp, but you also want to look at the quality of the marks itself. So the first thing I have to do once I see that this has a particular pattern, I have to then judge how much of this pattern is actually good quality and quantity. And if I decide, yes, this firearm is marking very well, I then move and I look over here to see if this also has the same quantity and quality of marks. Once I determine that the quantity and quality of marks is there, I'm then simply just trying to match up 
two patterns. So I'm trying to match up two UPC barcodes. And so I'm trying to see if they have the same spatial width, the same dimension, the same height, width, and then I'm looking at that, and once I determine that this does have the same pattern that this has, I could, can then conclude that they came from the same source or came from the same firearm. And in this case, did you determine that that bullet uh, marked as state's exhibit, and I didn't memorize the numbers here, uh, 279 did indeed, excuse me, was indeed fired from the firearm that you were provided as state's 260? Correct. Okay. So now what I want to do is I want to... Um, move ahead to the casings and and I'm going to show you five exhibits that have previously been put into evidence and in no particular order 263 262 276, 274, and 264. And I want to ask if you can take a look at those and if you recognize what they are. Yes, again, they all have the unique FDLE case number, the exhibit number, and my initials in my handwriting on both the outer, inner packaging, and the items itself. Now, um, looking at FDLE items number four, five, and six, uh, those happen to correspond in our case to markers in the front of the house three, four, and five. Not that that matters for your analysis. But with, now what I'm going to ask you about the casings, because now I'm going to talk kind of about the, I'll call it the back part of the gun. We talked about the barrel and the bullet, and you indicated that it is your opinion that that bullet was fired from that, uh, that firearm. Now let's talk about the casings. You talked a little bit earlier about how you're able to determine whether or not a casing is fired from a particular firearm. Um, with regard to those three casings, our, our, sort of our front yard casings, what uh, did you do in this regard with your analysis? So I filled out um, a comprehensive worksheet for these items. Um, and they have a little bit different as far as their head stamps. So they have two different brands of head stamps. One is federal and one is CBC. Um, but other than there being different brands, they're similar in their caliber. So they're all nine millimeter Luger caliber, which means they could be fired by a firearm that uses nine millimeter Luger caliber ammunition. Um, as far as the other class characteristics that you would see microscopically, they had parallel breech face marks. So again, that primer, when it hits back, it picked up the parallel marks off of the front of the slide. It has a D-shaped firing pin, which just simply means the firing pin actually has a flat back and is shaped like a D. Um, it also has shapes within that firing pin, which are similar. And then it also has um, a teardrop aperture, which basically is the hole that's in the back of the firearm where that D-shaped firing pin comes out. It's actually shaped like a teardrop. So all of these three cartridge cases, they all have the same class characteristics. They all were parallel, D-shaped, shapes within the D-shape, teardrop and nine millimeter looper. Okay. Now, did you go further and look at any individual characteristics that may tie those three cartridge casings to that firearm? Yes, I did. So tell us about that. So in this particular case, what I use for my identification, um, I look at the entirety of the bullet and then I'm looking at the patterns within the breech face marks, the firing pin impression, 
um, the firing pin marks itself, um, extractor and ejector, the chamber marks. Once I've looked at all of that, um, I then will start comparing it with the um, marks that I found on these cartridge cases that I actually made with the firearm. So in this particular case, I utilized a portion on the um, cartridge case itself called the firing pin aperture shear. And if we go back to that teardrop, which is your firing pin aperture, and so then your firing pin actually comes out of that, the shear itself happens when the firing pin hits that primer, and because of all that explosion, that primer actually goes back into that little bit of that teardrop shape, so it goes back into the firing pin hole. Then when the firearm itself is moving rearward, in order for it to unlock, the barrel drops down ever so slightly, and that actually does nice scrapes with the tool mark. So now that barrel took that cartridge case and it scraped it down on top of that um, slide itself. So those are the marks that I actually used um, for the cartridge case for identification. All right. And with regard to those first three um, that have been listed by <coughs> FDLE at the time, four, five, and six corresponding to our markers, three, four, and five, do you have an opinion on whether or not those casings uh, were fired from that firearm? Yes, I do. And what is that? I determined that these three cartridge cases were fired in this pistol. Now, I'm going to ask you a few more questions about that in a minute, but let's go to the, um, the closet casings, um, which are State's Exhibits 276 and 274. So I want to ask you a little bit about the same thing that I asked you about the first ones. Um, what did you do with regard to analyzing those two? So again, I filled out the comprehensive worksheet. I had one that was federal brand and one was CBC brand. Um, other than that slight difference in the brand, again, these were all 9mm Luger caliber cartridge cases. They did have the parallel breech face marks. They had that D-shaped firing pin with the shapes as well as that teardrop shaped aperture. Okay. And do you have an opinion on whether or not those two uh, shell casings or cartridge casings, excuse me, were fired from that firearm? Yes, I do. And what is that opinion? These two cartridge cases were also fired in this pistol. All right. Now, I want you to take a look at um, the cartridge casings, the ones you just talked about. And you mentioned that there's two different brands, correct? Yes. All right. One of them has a goldish color casing, correct? Correct. And what color is the other color casing, if you were to look at? So we have gold and we have silver. All right. What are those casings made of? Typically, the gold will be made of brass and the silver will be made of nickel. Okay. Are they both used in firearm ammunition manufacturing? Yes. Okay. And you determined that those two uh, casings were fired from that weapon. The brand doesn't matter as long as it's the right caliber ammunition, correct? Correct, yes. Okay. The same question for, I'll call them the front porch ones. Um, you indicated that there were two from one manufacturer and one from another manufacturer. Correct. Um, again, one color casing is what? Silver. And there's another one that is? Gold. But if you look at all of them, are they made up of two different brands it, collectively? Yes, I had three Federal and two CBC. All right. Now, does the brand have anything to do with your determination, other than acknowledging that there are different brands of ammunition? The fact that one is one color and one is another, does that have anything to do with what you do as far as the microscopic analysis of whether or not those casings were fired from that firearm or not? No, it does not. Okay. Have you seen cases or been asked to analyze cases uh, where there is multiple brands of ammunition being fired by the same firearm? Yes. So not only do I see it in cases where people just have different brands of ammunition, um, some people use the same brand, some people just use whatever they have on hand. Um, and then also for my personal use, which I every time I test fire, I also will test fire both brass and nickel. Um, and I do this so that just in case there might be an issue, not necessarily an issue, but some metals will pick up better marks than others. So I always want to make sure when I'm test firing that I have a good representative sample. 
So the most common materials we see are going to be brass and nickel. So I always want to fire two brass and two nickel in order to see that best repeatable pattern. So you telling the folks in the jury that your test fires exhibit 277, the ammunition that you used in the water tank, is also composed of two gold-colored ones and two silver-colored ones, brass yes. and nickel. Yes. specific forensic discipline is basically pattern or tool mark identification. Correct. Would you agree? And the tool being the firearm, right? <clears throat> yes. And your job is to match the firearm, if you do have a firearm, to a specific casing and or casings that you're provided from law enforcement. It's to determine if they can be it's not, my job isn't to actually make the match, it's to determine if they can be matched to one another. Fair enough. And in this case, you were actually provided with a firearm. Correct. And multiple casings, spent casings. Correct. What's the difference between a spent casing and a casing if there is one? There's no difference. No difference, okay. Um, are you familiar with PCAST? Yes. All right. So then you would be familiar with the fact that PCAST in 2017 um, had indicated that the scientific uh, validity of feature comparison methods, which is what you're doing, um, has not or falls short of the criteria for foundational validity. Yes, the PCAST came out in 2016, so it was about eight years ago, and it was a study that basically was saying that even though we had over 100 years of research, what they deemed to be scientific valid they wanted to have a specific type of research done. And the research that they wanted done was something that they like to term a black box study. So in 2016, they produced this report saying, hey, we, they're not saying that we're not a valid science, but they're saying in order to be in what their term of the scientific validity, they would want to see more research done and more government funding done so that we do these black box studies or called open studies. Since then, the field itself has done several of these black box studies and all of them have proven that firearms is still a valid science. So when you say they, we are talking about the President's Council of Advisories on Science and Technology, correct? Yes, we are. Yes, that's, who, that's, the, that's what an acronym stands for, yes. All right. And they haven't retracted uh, that report by the President's Council of Advisories on Science and Technology, correct? It wasn't retracted because they just wanted us to perform more research, which is what we did. All right, and that was in 2016 and 2017, essentially indicating that there was a lack of foundational validity in the pattern and or tool mark identification, that forensic field, if you will. Correct, because we did not have the black box studies, which we have since done at least on hand, I know of six. Okay, that was gonna be my next question. Do you know how many studies have been conducted to validate the field of for, uh, ballistic examination? My last count was six. All right. And which studies are you familiar with? Okay, so there is one, it's Keisel, I believe, or Keis Keisler. I believe that was in 2018. There was a Jamie Smith project. I believe that was 2019 or 2020. And then there was the AIM study, which was in 2020, ooh, that might have been 2021 as well, and that was done by the FBI. Those are the three that I can pull out of my memory. All right. And tell us if you can, or if you will, I'm sure you can, what type of methodology do you use or did FDLE use when you conducted your analysis in this case? As means, as what, what do you mean by methodology? What method, what scientific method did you use? The scientific method. Which is what? The scientific method, which is where you have a hypothesis, 
You state your hypothesis. You then perform your experiment to see if you can prove or disprove your hypothesis. So all forensic science is based upon the scientific method that we use for our science projects when we were in elementary school. Okay, but is there a specific name for the methodology that's used in uh, ballistic, forensic ballistic uh, examination? So that is just pattern matching is what is very simplistic way of saying the type of methods that we do because that's what we're using is pattern matching based on that tool mark principle where a harder object marks a softer object. Are you familiar with AFTE? Yes. What is that? The Association of Firearm and Tool Mark Examiners. All right. And is that a, an association that has created a methodology to do what you're testifying here today? Uh, yes, that's, I'm actually a member of that uh, association, and yes, there is the APTI. It's the same training that we provide to all firearms examiners. All right, so what methodology is associated with that association that you belong to? Pattern matching. Which is what? Which is matching patterns. That's, so it's the same that's thing what you I'm do. saying. So I'm like, yes, that's what I do. I match patterns. So you have fingerprints, you're looking at fingerprints, you're comparing fingerprints to fingerprints. If you have signatures, I'm comparing signatures to signatures. So it's a comparative science. It's not an analytical science in the sense of chemistry, but it's a comparative science. It's a subjective science, right? Portions of it are subjective, correct. Well, all of it is subjective. It's not objective, it's subjective. And that's one of the reasons why the President of the United States took issue with this type of forensic discipline, right? Incorrect. So subjective means that it's based upon your opinion. Objective means that someone can go behind me and do the same thing I did. So when you measure something, that's very objective, okay? So I can go and I can measure the base and I can say it's 0.355. Someone else can come behind me with a micrometer and measure the base and get 0.355. Then a person can also weigh the bullet. That also is objective. That's something that someone can use a tool and find the same exact answer that I have. After that, after we're looking at these subjective portions of it, that is where it comes to recognizing those patterns. That's where my training, my knowledge, my skills and ability, and having over 20 years in the field, that's where it comes into play. So I can look at patterns and recognize what actually constitute an identification, or I can recognize what something would constitute an elimination, saying that it wasn't a specific gun. So I have training on both of those ends of the spectrum. And would you agree with me that Glocks, that specific make of firearm, is one of the most popular types of guns in the United States, or in the world, actually? I, I can't testify to that. All right. Well, you testified earlier that you went to uh, numerous manufacturing uh, places. Correct, right? yes. Did you go to Glock's manufacturing? No, facility? they do not allow people into their system. They don't, so you did not go to the, the Glock manufacturing system? No, I did not. Even though there's one in Georgia, right? Yes, there's one in Georgia, but they do not allow tours. All right. So let's talk a little bit about um, class characteristics. What are class characteristics? <clears throat> class characteristics are the measure, measurable features of a group source. So that would be like the rifling, the six lanes and grooves with the right twist, the shape of the firing pin, the size of the firearm. All right, look, let's talk about the first <clears throat> nine millimeter Luger caliber cartridge case. What was the specific class characteristics about, and I'm looking at FDLE item number four. Tell us what the specific class characteristics are it is 9mm Luger caliber cartridge case. It has parallel breech face marks. It has a D-shaped firing pin with shapes within the firing pin. And it has a teardrop-shaped firing pin aperture shear. And are you reading from your bench notes? Yes. All right. And what about FDLE item number five? The 9mm Luger caliber cartridge case. And is there a difference between that plus P that you used in item four versus item five? Yes, um, a plus P just means that there's extra powder within that particular cartridge. So there is standards as to the amount of powder that can be in a cartridge. Um, once you go outside of that realm and you get a little higher, so you have a little more powder, a little more power, a little more pressure, they, they require you to put a plus P on the head stamp. So are you saying that the first cartridge case that we were speaking about had more powder, had more gunpowder in it? Correct, yes. All right. 
than the second one, which would have been ideally item number five. Correct, yes. All right. Is that because there are different types of ammunition or it's, something different? It's just whatever that manufacturer wants to load their cartridge with. All right, so tell me who was the manufacturer of that first one fired nine millimeter Luger caliber <clears throat> plus P? The plus P space. is by a company that is known as CBC. And then FDLE item number five, who was the manufacturer of that cartridge case or that projectile? Federal. FC? Yes. And what about item number six, that nine millimeter Ruger caliber cartridge case? Also federal. And then FDLE item number 12, the fired 9mm Luger caliber plus P cartridge case. That's a CBC again. And what does CBC stand for? It's cartridges de, it's in Spanish. It's cartridges de Brazil cartuchos. I can't, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm very bad at that. But it's a Spanish uh, <laughs> company. I apologize. That's why it's known as CBC. It's easy for firearms examiners to just say CBC. So it's a Spanish manufacturer type of ammunition. Yeah, it's just, yes, it's just what the company, yes. Is it a common type of ammunition? CBC, yes, that's a common brand, yes. What about FC? Is that a common brand of ammunition? Federal is also common, yes. All right, and then the one fired, finally, looks like you had five cartridge, case, cartridge casings that you looked at, the one fired 9 millimeter Luger caliber um, cartridge case that was would be a FC as well? Number 13, yes. Yes, ma'am. All right, so specifically, I want to start again back up the list with item number four, that plus P, that CBC cartridge case. Tell me what specific individual characteristics that you deemed um, to be unique to that cartridge case and that firearm. So um, like I explained with that firing pin aperture shear, so what really makes that unique is that during the manufacturing process of that slide, you will have a tool that actually will cut down and saw off that front of that slide. And so that's gonna leave tool marks going in this direction. The next tool will then come inside and that's actually gonna drill that hole. So now you have a tool that's making marks in opposing directions. So now you have tool marks going this way and tool marks going this way. That's why it helps to make it very unique because you think about it, if I'm scraping something like this with metal fragments, it's going to draw all the fragments down this way. And so now I have this nice kind of like gradient scrape pattern. Like think like you cut butter, you can see those knives, the, the little tines, the little teeth on the knives make a nice mark. Now I'm gonna take a spinning item and I'm then gonna spin into those. And now I'm going to make that firing pin hole itself. So now I have tool marks made this way with rough metal and now I have rough metal that has been spun in many different directions. So that's why the firing pin after shear is a great area to make an ident identification on because you have two different patterns that are, that are then making the pattern that this gun will make. So within that firing pin after shear itself, I have a nice series of stria or scrapes on that pattern, which are actually causing all the peaks, ridges, and furrows and making that pattern that I can see matches this one on the firearm. Okay, so specifically with regards to item number four, what were the individual characteristics that you noted in your benchmarks that matched or were consistent with the marks from the firearm? So that was the striations that I saw within the firing pin after shear. And how many striations did you, did you see? I do not count. Is there a, a magical number that you use? What if you only saw one striation mark? It depends on if there's marks within the striation mark. Were there marks within the striation marks? In this particular case, there was just a pattern, a series of striations. But we don't know how many striation marks created that pattern that you're talking about. Correct, yes. You're looking at the overall pattern itself. You need both quantity and quality. And you can't give us the quantity. It's not part of my exam to actually count every fine line that I see, no. All right, so you cannot give us the quantity, correct? Correct. And then you said something about quality. 
Yes. So you can't give us the quantity, but you, and you also cannot give us the quality of those striation marks on that specific cartridge case. The quality is basically looking at the marks itself. So if you go back to that stamp analogy, so like if your first stamp might be nice, clear, clear, crisp pattern that you can see. And then the next one going down the line might be more blurred or phasing, or you might not be as deep or as depth. So that way I'm not getting lights and shadows onto that pattern. So instead of looking at something that's 3D, the quality might have only made me be able to see it maybe in a flattened or a two-dimensional. Two so I need to have enough dimension in there, 3D, enough quality in order to bring up that pattern and allow me to see with all the different shapes and valleys that are going on that topography. So that's why we need the quality. We need to have that depth so that the microscope can shine light and allow us to see. And then we also have to have the quantity. So you don't just want to have one line. That obviously isn't making a pattern. We all know what constitutes a pattern. It's several things repeated over and over again. So that's what I'm looking for, quality and quantity. All right, so let me go back to the pattern. You said several things repeated over and over. But you can't tell us what those several things are. Well, you can describe what those are, but you can't give us the specific number of items that you looked like, you looked at to form that pattern, right? Well, I look at everything on the cartridge case. So I'm looking at all the information that's on the cartridge case, whether it be on the sidewall, from the extractor, from the ejector, that whole entire cartridge case I'm evaluating. I'm making sure that everything has the same correspondence, everything's in the same relative position. So like if my extractor is up at 10 o'clock, on this gun, the little hook, when it pulls out my cartridge case, I have to make sure that on these, that extractor is also in the 10 o'clock position. So I'm making sure that everything has the same relative spatial relationship to each other. So I wanna make sure that my extractor is in the same spot, that that teardrop shape is exactly where it's supposed to be oriented. And then from there, I move down to areas that I'm going to use to take such a, like a representative photograph so that I can use that for my recollection purposes. But I'm looking at the entire. Let me of just the let me stop here. I appreciate all of the information that you are giving us, but I want to talk specifically about this case, not generalities, this specific, this specific case. So with regards to FDLA item number four, were you able to obtain sufficient quality in order to do a microscopic examination? Yes. And what about the quality um, of that specific cartridge, cartridge case can you tell us? So the quality of it had enough quality where the firearm had this particular firearm had left enough marks or enough depth and spatial relationship of those marks itself. So when I was able to look at my test fires, I could see the quality and the quantity of marks that this particular firearm had in any pattern that it was producing onto that, onto those cartridge cases. So this is my known source, this is ground state zero. Once I am making samples from this, I then can look and see exactly what type of pattern. I can see how many, I can see the depth, I can see everything in that pattern. And I've fired that four times and I'm getting that gun to repeat four times. So I get four times the repetition on the cartridge cases and four times that repetition on those bullets. So now once I've looked at those bullets and I've right, looked let me at those stop, cartridge cases. Let, let me just, let me stop again. You said enific, uh, excuse me, enough marks on the casing. I'm asking you, what specific marks did you see and how many marks are enough? Right, but in order to explain that, I have to explain that when you're working with this gun, I am then being able to reproduce and see exactly what marks it's reproducing in that pattern whether it has good quality and good repetition. So this gun had good quality marks and good repetition. Once I look at that, I am then going to move to these samples to see if they have the same quality and they have the same repetition. So by seeing the quality and the quantity of the marks that this gun is leading or having, I then can compare to the quantity and qualities of marks of this. Once I determine that the same quantity and quality of marks that are on this firearm are also on this, I make my conclusion and that would be an identification. Now, if they were different, I would then have to make an elimination. Sure. So as you sit here, can you tell us about the quantity and the quality of the marks between that firearm and specifically FDLE item number four, that cartridge case? The quantity, the quantity and the quality of the marks are of sufficient agreement so that I can say that this gun fired these components. Well, what is sufficient agreement, I guess is what I'm getting to. Okay. Are there, are so, the number of marks? It's both quantity and quality. So if we talk about sufficient agreement, 
I apologize, it's going to get in the weeds for a little bit. When I was in training, we had to shoot um, samples from known matches. So I would take a gun and I would shoot it over and over again. And then I would look to see the amount of marks that were similar. So I would look to see the quantity and quality of marks from a gun that I know came, had, and shot those same components. Once I determined that, that now is where I need to be. That's sufficient agreement. So when I see that much similarity coming from a gun, I then know that that's in my identification zone. And that's my question for you, is what in your mind, in your subjective mind, when you were doing this analysis, is enough, sufficiently enough, right. in to order, make that agreement? Right, in order to explain sufficient agreement, I then also have to talk about no non-matches. So now I took two guns and I fired it, and now I take those components and I know they came from a different gun, and I'm looking at that to see how much quantity and quality will repeat. So in this case, you're going to have your differences outweigh your similarities. And over here, your similarities are going to outweigh your differences. So that's the range that you're looking at when you asked about sufficient agreement. But you're so, not really giving me a range. You're talking about generalities and, and, and you're not giving me any information. You're giving me subjective uh, phrases and terms. And my simple question for you is what was the sufficient agreement <coughs> for you regarding that firearm and exhibit, not exhibit, but FDLE item number four, which enabled you to come here and give an opinion to indicate that that was sufficient enough to have identified that cartridge case to that firearm. Right, so the firing pin after sheer impression that I have from this firearm when I compared it to the firing pin after sheer impression of all these five cartridge cases, there was sufficient agreement within that pattern of quantity and quality. So you cannot answer what was the sufficient agreement between that firearm and all of those cartridge cases. The sufficient agreement was that the patterns matched. What was it about the patterns that matched? The spatial relationship of the patterns, the shape of the patterns, how when I took two of them and I lined up, I could take my center line, I could move it this way and that way, and everything lined up like a pattern did. They were matches. Okay, you still haven't answered my question, but I'm going to move, I'm going to move on. Would you, would you agree with me that nickel and uh, brass are different metals? Yes. Do you know which one is a more softer metal? Um, it depends because they're not always 100% homogeneous. So sometimes you'll have brass mixed with other metals and nickel mixed with other metals. So it depends on the brand and it depends on the manufacturer. All right. Based upon this or these two manufacturers, do you know whether or not the nickel was harder than the brass? I can't answer that because they use different brass and nickel all the time. So whoever they can get the cheapest or whatever deal they have going on, they change their makeup all the time. So it's just a generality saying something's brass or nickel, but this could have some tin in it. This could have some tin. This could also have some brass and nickel in it. They change all the time with, am with ammunition factories. They're not consistent. All right. Would you agree with me that, that the type of metal for that specific cartridge case could produce maybe I say different markings, but maybe not as many markings as maybe potentially another cartridge case may because of the type of metal that you're, you're analyzing. The type of metal can affect um, how a tool leaves a mark, correct, yes. And that is why I test fire nickel and brass so that I can see what this gun does when it test fires nickel and what this gun does when it test fires brass. That's why I want to do that. I want to make sure that I have a representative example of what I have in my case. So I have brass and nickel here, so I'm going to test brass and nickel there in order so I can see if perchance that pattern might change from brass to nickel. And in this particular case, it did not change from brass to nickel. The metal did not have a factor on whether or not it was repetitive. Now you talked about individual or unique characteristics. Aren't there also unique characteristics that go along with the manufacturing process itself? You're talking about during the manufacturing process? Yes. Yes. All right. Did you look into that with regards to conducting your analysis on these five different cartridge cases? 
Yes, before I test fire, these cartridges would come from my stock ammunition. So before I test fire any of the ammunition, I take it first and I look underneath my microscope. And I want to see if there are any manufacturing marks that are on those particular uh, cartridges before I actually make my samples with them. Because again, those can actually um, hinder what we're seeing underneath the microscope. So I'll take my samples, my exemplars, I look under the microscope. Once I've done that, I then will label them with the number and then I put them in there and then put them in the gun and then those are the four that I will use for my testing. Okay, so I'm, 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 I guess I'm kind of confused. You did four test fires, right? Correct. You used two different types of ammunition, correct? Correct. How many of the cartridge casings that were provided to you did you examine against the ones that you had fired? All of them. All of them. Okay, that's what I, that's what I thought. That's too me. Yes, ma'am. I'm to, sorry. No, 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 it's okay. I'm not going to cut you short, but I do need to give um, everyone a break. Uh, so, um, about 10 minutes. All rise, please.
Will rise, please. report, right? Correct, yes. Yeah. Okay. And you had indicated that there had been several several reports since that PCAS report that came out, and one of them being one that you're familiar with, which was done by the FBI. Yes, correct. Right? <coughs> All right. And in that FBI report, which we talked about subjective versus subjective one of the things that they were wanting to do was to make pattern analysis, um, ballistic forensic analysis, more uh, objective as opposed to subjective, individual, right? Um, are you talking about the study or are you talking about PCAS? The study. Okay. The study that came after PCAS, based upon PCAS. The black box right? study, yes. And several of the things that this study wanted firearms examiners and independent researchers to do was to create some type of automated or computer-based objective determinations. Basically, use a computer, use something that's automated as opposed to just the human eye using a double-sided microscope. <coughs> Are you aware of that? I'm not aware of that that was the purpose of the AIM study itself. I am I'm aware that there are some uh, people that would like to see a more statistical based analysis similar to DNA. I know that that has been brought up before. Right, and this is the FBI, right? Yes, there's other places that have brought that up as well. I'm not sure about the AIM study. When I took the AIM study, I participated in that. I did not, um, that wasn't one of the things that we were told to do during our testing. Well, that was one of their goals, I guess is what I'm saying, is to create something that's automated to make it, to make it more objective as opposed to subjective. In addition to that, um, the FBI also wanted there to be more statistical evaluation methods used in the identification of tool marks. Do you agree? Again, I don't have the AIM study in front of me. The portion that I participated in, I don't recall statistics being involved in the testing that I did. And in addition, finally, and we'll get to that in a, in a well, we'll get to it now, um, that the error rates in that statistical automated objective methodology also be reported. That was also one of the AIMs or the FBI. Yes, was to have an error rate. Correct, yes. Now, what is your error rate? <clears throat> so error rate in accordance to like my proficiency testing, which I do yearly, my error rate, I have not, I've always passed my proficiency. Okay, so, and how long you, how long were you with, I was gonna say FBI, the Florida Department of Law Enforcement? 18 and a half years. All right, and you get tested once a year? Uh, just for that prof specific proficiency test, correct, yes. Okay, and you've not always passed your proficiency tests? I have passed all of my proficiency tests. Oh, you have passed yes. them all? Yes. All right, and they're given once a year? Yes, it's required at least once a year, correct. And is it done internally or from some other agency? An external source, the collaborative testing services, they make the test and they provide the test and then the test is sent to us. We don't know the answer, we just get the test. We uh, complete the test and we send off our answers and then they let us know if we're correct. And you've always passed? Correct. 
So your error rate is zero. For the CTS testing, correct, yes. And when I say that your error rate is zero, that's, that's virtually impossible, right? If we're looking at my testing on the proficiency test, it would be zero because I've always gotten everything correct. So that would not be impossible. Well, you would agree with me that in everything in life and in everything in science, there is always a margin of error. Yes. Would you agree? Yes. So in this specific analysis that you conducted, what margin of error was used? What do you mean? Well, there's always a, a plus or minus as to what the true um, opinion is, if you will. Does that make sense? Yes. Yeah. So what would you say, because <clears throat> again, it's um, subjective, would be your margin of error in the report that you documented? So with um, the Florida Department of Law Enforcement, as well as with the Hillsborough County Sheriff's Office, um, we are an accredited laboratory. And what that means is that we have an outside body that comes in yearly and they check and make sure that we are following their guidelines as to what a forensic science laboratory should do. So they have a set of standards that we must follow. Then they also will make sure that we're following whatever our personal standard operating procedures are per each agency. So they come in on a yearly basis and they will actually grab files that we've done. They check and make sure and verify that we're doing everything correctly and that everything is sound in these files in our casework. Now with that, to be accredited, you also have to have a checks and balance system within your laboratory. And so that's quality assurance and quality control. So anytime you would have an error, it would then have to be reviewed. And they'd have to review whether it was a typographical area error, excuse me, error, or like whether you just transpose numbers, but all of that is reviewed and all of that is recorded. Anytime an error is made, it is sent to the accrediting body and then they will then determine what occurs when an error is made. So in both of my laboratories, I have quality assurance and quality control. So once I have come to the conclusion that I had made an identification, it then has to go through a verification process. All right, so basically FDLE has various standard, standard operating procedures and quality assurance uh, procedures that are in place and they have those in place for every forensic discipline that is uh, within their agency, correct? Correct. As well as your agency now that you currently work for, which is um, Hillsborough County Sheriff's Office? Correct. All right. They have their own set of standard operating procedures and quality assurance and things of that nature. Correct. And the accrediting body that you speak of uh, what what body is that? So it's ANAB, -A American National Standards Institute, National Accreditation Board. And, and that, that is, go ahead, I'm sorry. Uh, that accreditation body does um, other laboratories, not just forensic laboratories, but there is a specific group that just does forensic laboratories and they have a set of standards that, in essence, what it is, is there's world standards that you have to have for laboratories. And then from there, they go down to the next level. So then there's world international standards then from there they're going to break it down into what country standards and then they're going to break it down into what science you're in so if you're in like metallurgy or if you're in forensics then those have a set of standards so there's a lot of set of standards that they have that you have to follow you have to have a certain quality assurance and control system all of that they set forth and if you don't produce good work or if you're not it then they won't accredit you anymore and does FGLE have to pay for this accreditation you do pay to have the service for it to them to come and actually analyze because you are taking other firearms examiners, DNA experts, and all of them, you're taking them off of their job. So what you do is you pay for their travel and then they can come and then they will look and they will do. So that's what you do. You're paying for them to come and evaluate you and make sure that you're good. If you are not good, so let's say they come and they call them findings and there is findings, you have 90 days to correct those findings. If it's a specific person, they then will evaluate that person and then that person either gets retraining or that person will then get um, exterminated. Or you just would no longer be accredited by ANAP. Um, you could do that, yes, but 
you do not want to be in an unaccredited lab because that is proving to people that we are doing exactly what we're saying. And also, anytime you're dealing with the science, it's always good to have checks and balances. So you always want to have more research. You always want to have someone come up behind you and double check what you're doing and make sure that all of your uh, I's are dotted, your T's are crossed. So it's always good practice to do that. That checks and balances once a year, right? Uh, no, the checks and balances from A and A B, yes, that is once a year. But checks and balances every case that leaves the agency has to go through checks and balances. All right. So let me let me ask you this: um, What sort of policies and procedures are in place, or were in place, or are in place at FDLE to deal with the issue of confirmation bias? Do you know what that is? Yes. What policies and procedures does FDLE have? To, to deal with that phenomenon? So we've had training on confirmation bias. Um, we also, um, with that, I don't know what they do now. I haven't been there in a year and a half, and I know they just did a revamping of stuff. But at the time I was there, um, we did get training on confirmation bias um, and how um, specifically, like, if someone gives you, you know, two items, and they say, these go together, and they give it to you. They say confirmation bias is now when I'm looking at these, I'm automatically saying, oh, they, they go together because you told me they did. Um, however, in my 20 years of experience, there's a lot of times that people tell me these go together and they don't go together. So that's one of the things that works for us. We're like, well, this is a 9 and this is a 40, so obviously they don't go together. But we have training on that that was given to us with FDLE. Um, as far as the confirmation bias, um, that's also what the proficiency test does as well, because the proficiency test also will test to see exactly how um, you're going about your casework. And then we also have a verification process. <coughs> So anytime I come to a conclusion, another trained examiner has to go behind me and verify what I did. So I could say something was an identification, and then the person could come behind me and agree with me or disagree with me. So we have to have everything checked and balanced. So in fact, that's, that's kind of what happened in this case. You get a, a case tracking form where you're given a synopsis of what the detective believed happened, right? Uh, yes, yeah, sometimes the case tracking form will have um, a description, sometimes it's not correct. Right. And the description that was given to you was that Mr. Murdoch shot Lisa Bunce and that he also shot um, Sanda Andrews and he asked you to process the Glock or the handgun, the Glock handgun, for DNA well, actually, was asked to be processed for touch DNA before any ballistic testings, and then you were to compare that firearm, one firearm, to the spent casings and the projectiles that were recovered at the scene of the crime. Right? So that's really confirma confirmation bias. You are getting the answers to the test prior to conducting the test, meaning they're telling you, here's a firearm, here's some casings, do they match? Yes, that's always the question that I get in all of my cases, so it's not really confirmation biased. If they're sending a bunch of cartridge cases, the question is, do they all go together? How many guns were involved? If they send in a bunch of bullets, it's the same thing. What type of gun could have possibly fired them? Did they all come from the same gun? How many guns were involved in the crime? If they submit a gun, obviously, what are you going to do? You're going to compare your submitted components to the gun and see if they go together. If they don't, then you're going to want to try and give information on to what possible, the other possible gun could be. So that's just a typical, anytime we get a case with a gun, a cartridge case, and a bullet, we're going to do comparisons. That's why we're a comparative science. Right, but you got this information prior to you conducting your analysis. Do you Meaning, compare all of these items? Yes. Yes, that's my manager will assign it yes. and say you need to compare this case. Yes. And that's a great example of confirmation bias. Don't you agree? No. Well, you're not doing it in a black box. You're not saying, hey, here's a firearm. Here's some shell casings. Compare them. Give us your opinion as to whether or not whatever it is. Do these, do these match or, or what have you? Right. Well, right. I mean, I can't, I don't go to the crime scene and collect them. <clears throat> so if the case comes across my desk and they say, hey, compare these. That's my job is to compare stuff. I don't, I don't, it, it doesn't matter whether or not someone said, hey, you need to compare, whether the CTF tells me to compare the gun to the bullets in the cartridge case or not, that is what my job is. My job as a firearms examiner is to determine whether or not fire and ammunition components came from a firearm. So 
It's just actually my job. It's not really confirmation bias. But it is. You, you disagree. Wait, I'm sorry, was there a question? I said, but it is confirmation bias. But you disagree. disagree with me. I don't disagree if, if this is the um, items I'm given, because sometimes they give me items that don't go together. Sometimes they give me items that go together. My job is to analyze the evidence and tell what it actually is speaking, what it actually says. That's my job. Do you know how many false positive errors you have had while working on FGLE? None to my knowledge. To your knowledge? Yes. And do you know how many misidentifications you have had while at FGLE? None to my knowledge. you that tomorrow is going to be a shorter day, um, so if you needed to make some appointment or take care of an errand or something late afternoon, um, tomorrow would be a good day to do that. I anticipate we will be concluding no later than 1 o'clock tomorrow, so we, we may work into lunch um, so that we can get you on your way, but I wanted to let you know that so you could plan accordingly. Please enjoy your evening. We will see you tomorrow morning at 8.30. All right, please.